Okay, I guess we are live. Uh, that was fast. Okay, cool. Uh, there's only one person here yet, though. Hey, whoever showed up. Uh, I'm just getting everything set up, trying to make sure that the chat actually works this time, which didn't work so well last time. Uh, let me know if the audio sounds off. Uh, last time there was a bit of a problem with uh, echo at the beginning. Okay, good, that does seem to be working. Okay, sweet. All right, we're going to get started real soon. Okay, we got the chat going. Okay, we got... All right, let's do this. It's 258, whatever, let's start. Okay, cool, let's get started with this. Uh, actually, I'm going to give people like two minutes to filter in because it's. I said it would start at 3 p.m., when I was going to start. I was actually, before this stream started, I was trying to figure out if I can, if I could actually stream music, because I would love to have, you know, some music in the background. Uh, Sam Sacconi in his stream, he had some music in the background, some MJ, and uh, it was really nice. Um, and then, but then I kind of got a little spooked because I was looking around and I was like, well, is it actually legal? Like, I know that um, if you stream copyrighted stuff, it, like in the background of your music, and if the copyright holder really doesn't want that on YouTube, then they can like do a takedown notice, right? Um, so I was kind of concerned about that. So I started like googling around, and as far as I can tell, nobody knows, and it seems like it's kind of like a gray zone, and like basically everyone's just kind of looking the other way. But I'm not a big fan of gray zones, um, so I didn't want to take the risk. I'm sorry, I was gonna put on some some Steely Dan, some David Bowie, something, but I just didn't want to take the risk. I was even looking around for trying to think of what classical music is like um, royalty free, and even like Chopin, which is like the only classical music I really, really like. Even that apparently has uh, is like cr crazy, crazy royalties you gotta pay, even to play it in the background. So yeah, so it's just gonna be me talking. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, so it's 3 p.m. Let's get started. So I wanted to start off this stream. First off, um, what is the point of this stream? Oh, and. Uh, by the way, if you want to communicate back with me, either use this chat or use uh, the Slack channel, um, which I linked here. Um, hang on a sec, let me just provide a link for this. Is this the URL? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, just, just chat with me here, and, um, and that's how we'll communicate back and forth. So anyway, um, so why did I start this stream? Well, I kind of started it. It was like a spur of the moment idea yesterday. Basically, the thought I had was, man, I have a lot of GitHub notifications to get through because I kind of been putting them off for a while. And I thought to myself, why not make it more fun? Like, why not make it a little social? You know, like, open source software is fundamentally social. And so why not make it even more social by doing uh, live streaming? Because, like, people will watch other people play video games on live stream. People will watch people doing just about anything online. So like, why not open source software? Like, it's educational for people. It shows like what it's like to do open source because I think it's a it's a very different um, it, it's a very different picture at least from from what I had uh, when I first got started with open source software. Like um, like there's this great uh, yeah there's this great cartoon that kind of like sums it up. Um, I wonder if I can find it. Um, yeah, there's this great I think it's called commit strip. You know. Yeah, this is this is like this really sums up open source in a nutshell. Like when you actually look at how people are doing it, um, like <laughs> this this comic I just absolutely love. Um, everybody can see all right, right? I'm projecting. Yeah, we can. Um, like how you think open source apps are being maintained? You imagine it's like this team. It's like I've been assigned you this validation flow. We said we'd ship tonight. Let's do it. But then how it's actually maintained is this, this guy saying, just one more ticket before going to bed. <laughs> like, that's pretty much it. Um, although it's not nearly so lonely as it would appear from this comic, right? Like, it's not really this lonely. Because as it turns out, open source, like, it's not done in a vacuum. And, like, you, um, when you work on this stuff, you work with other people online. And so it's actually, like, much more social than, than you might think. Anyway, but I'm just trying to like pull the veil back a little bit and just kind of show what it's like to actually do open source software. So anyway, let's get into it. Um, uh, yeah, let's just. Oh, hey, Yang's here. 
Um, hey, Jan. Uh, so anyway, so like I was saying, so the goal is to kind of lift the veil and show, okay, what is it actually like doing open source software? The other goal is just to kind of keep me company while I'm working on these 70 unread get -up notifications because, you know, I can actually get through these. Um, that's a pretty reasonable goal for a Sunday. I'd say I can get through these GitHub notifications. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to actually do a little bit more in-depth stuff. Yesterday I found I was mostly just kind of putting out fires, like I was just responding to people in issues and like trying to solve their problems and not always doing a great job of it, but trying to at least like, you know, be there for them. Um, today I want to actually deep dive into an issue. So the issue I want to deep dive into is one that I tried to tackle yesterday. Um, and I didn't really have a chance to, and it's this one, where someone opened a pull request on PouchDB Find, which is a query engine for PouchDB. And they add, they found a bug, uh, I'm almost certain it's a bug, and they have a test to reproduce. So it's like the perfect case where like they, they did due diligence, they found the, the test case to reproduce, and really, like someone who knows the code base should be able to go in there and fix it pretty easily. So I'm gonna demonstrate how to do that. So um, I said that when I was looking at this yesterday, I suspected that the issue is that um, See, they're searching for null, and it's throwing an error. And what it should do is it should actually let them search for null, like literally searching for null. But I think it's just you know, like throwing a, a null, uh, an undefined exception somewhere. So uh, to test this, uh, what I've got is I've got PouchDB server running in one tab. And then I've got uh, this guy's or this person's fork in the other tab. And yesterday I was trying to run the full test suite, but it took forever. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm actually just going to try to run a part of the test suite, and I'll show how that works. So um, in this project, I have it set up so that I can point to any CouchDB, which in this case is going to be CouchDB server. Reason being, the tests don't pass against CouchDB 1.6 right now because it's using a new API that's only available in leading edge CouchDB. So make things simple. I'm testing it in PouchDB server because PouchDB server also incidentally supports this API that it's testing. Um, so I'm going to test this in the browser because I just find it easier to debug that way. I could debug it in Node, but I figure that it makes more sense to debug here. So, uh, okay. So you see, I could run the full test suite, but then it's going to kill my CPU. Um, <laughs> like it's already kind of under heavy load right now. So uh, a trick I'm going to use is that this is a Mocha test suite, and Mocha has this trick where you can just add a query parameter at the top and say grep equals whatever, and then you can search for tests and filter just those tests. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I don't know if there's a keyword I can use for this person's pull request, but I'm going to figure it out by, uh, I'm going to go into WebStorm, which is the editor I like to use. I'm going to go in, I'm going to do a git compare with branch, and I'm going to compare with origin master. And this will show me what they added in their pull request, um, which you, you could see in GitHub as well, but I just kind of like seeing it here. Um, so you can see they added these tests. So then uh, what I typically do in this case is I just add a string to each of these so I can use it for, filter, for filtering, and then I delete it later. Um, one good thing to do is to go in and find the issue and just add the number, like the issue number, because that's like perfectly reasonable. Um, you could even, like, like that, that would be fine for a final pull request, right? Because then at least, um, you know, you have a record of the issue, or, or sorry, of the test and the issue that was linked to that test. So, and then on top of that, it allows me to filter more easily. So it's perfect. So I'm going to save this. How am I doing on sound? Is the sound sounds fine? Right? Somebody would have said it if the sound was weird. Hopefully, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going to hope. Uh, Fluent 720p, good audio. Okay, sweet. That's good. Let's see if we can keep that up. Uh, I've got my my makeshift curtain back up, which is just a bed sheet hanging over my window. Oh man, I am, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, really need, I really need to get actual curtains, especially when it's uh, sundown. But um, anyway, uh, so yeah, so now that I'm able to actually filter it, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add 170 to search, and so it should be able to find just those issues that this person created. Um, and it's not, oh right. I'm dumb. That's supposed to be ampersand, not question mark, because I already have another query parameter in there. Okay, good. So the test is failing as it should. Um, but then the funny thing is, so, so here's the funny thing um, about this particular test, and this is why I ran this test in the way I did. So what you'll notice is that uh, there were six total tests, right, of which there were four failures. And 
the first three were local and the second three were HTTP. And what that means is that it ran those it ran this, these three tests against local PouchDB in the browser, and then it ran those same tests against remote PouchDB server, which could just as easily be CouchDB, but in this case it's CouchDB server. Um, and they're both failing. Oh, actually that's right. So that's actually expected behavior because if it's failing in local CouchDB, it's also going to fail in CouchDB server. Uh, really, in this case, the gold standard should be CouchDB2, um, which uh, I don't... When was the last time I ran a virtual machine that had that? Shoot. Um, yeah, so actually I need to run this against a virtual machine. Um, and, ah, shoot, what's the fastest way to get CouchDB2 up and running? Um, a headset. Um, yeah, that's true. If it's, if it's booming, then maybe it's because I'm talking too loud. I can talk more softly. Um, I, I definitely don't have, I don't have a headset, unfortunately. Sorry about that, Young. Um, but anyway, I want to run CouchDB2, and I want to do it the fastest way possible. Let me think. Uh, I could have sworn I had, uh, I had a digital ocean droplet up and running, but I, I shut it down. So let me try to run it from Docker, because I know there's a Docker command to run CouchDB2. You, ha you, have to, you have to build it from source because it's not released yet. So uh, let's see if I can find the Docker. Because it just occurred to me, I don't want to test against CouchDB server because then I'm going to be chasing my tail because I want to make sure that it's, that it's working against the gold standard. Does this actually run on Mac? I don't, I don't know. I actually don't recall if I even set up Docker here on this Mac. I might have to get a Linux virtual box. Yeah, I don't have Docker set up on this. Um, I think I have a public Linux box set up somewhere. Yeah, and I'm not going to... Okay, and there's no, there's no security danger by SSH in now because I'm not going to show my password on the screen. Okay, so let's just do it. So I, I have... I have this little Amazon EC2 instance. It just has a bunch of stuff on it. Um, so let's go in here and let's go into. All right, let's go in here and let's do uh, a bunch of projects. Uh, let's make one called CouchDB. And let's see that. And then let's do. Let's just run that Docker command. I think I have Docker set up on this machine. Okay. Well, you know, let's just do it. Not really doing open source unless you're installing Docker from AppGet, huh? That's like <laughs> that's the moment where you're like, wow, now I'm I'm really I am deeply in this world. I am deeply in this weird, weird world of open source. I'm installing this thing called Docker. I don't I don't even kind of know what Docker is. I have a vague understanding of what Docker is, but I'm I'm using it now, so that's how it goes. Um, so it's set up Docker. I don't remember if I need the sudo, but I don't think I do. And I'm going to set it up, okay, I can set it up on any port, but I'm going to set it up on 6984, is that one that I'm using? I'll set it up, I'll set it up on 6985 just to be safe. Okay, usage docker, what's, that's totally correct. What's wrong with that command? Is this a different Docker? Window, this this is a different Docker. I am, ah, oh, this is not good. All right, um, well, maybe I can't solve this issue right now. This is really sad. Um, oh, Jan's gonna set me up with 2.0. Hey, that's awesome, thanks. <laughs> okay, so, pro tip, folks, if you want to easily set up CatchDB 2.0 from source, all you need to do is have Jan Leonard right there and <laughs> ready to help you out. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, those kind of resources aren't available to everybody, but um, I'm super, uh, super honored that Jan is willing to help me out with this because, though, like, CatchDB 2 is not, it's not that awkward to set up. I have done it. I, I did it with, like, a digital ocean droplet. It's not too bad. Um, I think you just need to, yeah, you just need to set up a digital ocean droplet with Docker built in, and then you just SSH in, and you can do it all through the web GUI, in fact, and then you just run this command, and then it's running, uh, it's running CouchDB2. Ah, and so it's apt-get docker.io. Well, actually, let's see then, in that case, let me apt-get 
remove Docker because I got the wrong Docker. And then we'll yeah sure. And then we'll have to install Docker.io. Man, naming things is such a huge problem, right? And like this, this happens all over the place. Like even even Node, there was an uh, some kind of app repo called Node. What? Oh, maybe I have an older version of Ubuntu. Uh, is it get update or upgrade? I can never remember. Update. I'll see if I can beat you to it, Jan. And of course, I got my coffee ready. This is super, super important to have a steady stream of coffee. If you can have that caffeine flowing through your bloodstream. Okay, so. All right, so I've got uh, I got Docker installed. All right, let's run Docker, port 1695. No such file or directory, user bin Docker. Is this one of those things where you have to log out and log back in again? Or like, I just, is, oh, I haven't installed Docker yet. Um, getting ahead of myself. Oh, can't find docker.io. What, you have to get a special, yeah. Do you have to get a special PPA or something? I don't even know which version of Ubuntu I'm on. Um, all right, that doesn't tell you which Ubuntu it is. I can't remember how to find your Ubuntu version, but um, it's like DC releases or something? Something like that. It doesn't matter. In any case, uh, docker install app get. This is, this is some pro programming right here in action. Just Google it and find the first result. All right, let's see. I think Jan's gonna beat me too. I really think he is. Um, oh, they like oh they they like you to install it with curl sh. That's that's fun. Um, well, YOLO, right? Let's just do it. Hmm. Well, those error messages are not very friendly, but um, gotta hope that everything's cool. And of course, it is running sudo. Look at that. I just I just did sudo sh on my on my EC2 instance. We got we got some great security best practices going on in this stream. I am I I am giving you all the hard won knowledge of my ten years of of software hackery. Um, yeah, luckily this is just a server I use to host like my little like. My little side projects and stuff, and so it's not, um, it's definitely not generating business for anyone or anything. Um, this is just where I, I host. I actually mostly host old Java projects on here. I used to be really, really into, into Java. I have a bunch of um, Grails projects because there was a time, there was a hot moment when like it seemed like Grails, which was Groovy on Rails, was going to be this, this new thing that was going to like um, be like the, the enterprise answer to Rails, right? And then like I got really excited about it, and it, it never really took off, unfortunately. So, okay, if you would like to use Docker as a non-read user, you should now consider adding reads in the Docker group, something like this. Okay, cool, I trust you. That sounds about right. Let's do it. Okay, that's fine. I don't know why I'm getting that error message, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so now, after all this, I should be able to finally run Docker. So I'm running uh, CatchDB dev, port 16.85. Did I just start the Docker daemon? Maybe I have to log out and log back in again. What is Jan saying? I can SSH into. Okay. Um, let's see. You can SSH into root at. Oh, you set up a. Okay, so you set up a. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's really. Okay, you beat me to it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, all right, I'll do that. SSH here. Okay, cool. And uh, do you have like an Nginx or something on there? Or uh, uh, oh, I'll just set up a tunnel. Actually, that's the easiest thing. Here's a nice trick. Okay, so here's here's a tip. Um, it's kind of uh, one of those like sysadmin, DevOps, whatever kind of tricks. So you can do SSH L, and you can set up a um, a proxy. So like you can say. I want my local 6984 port to point to this machine's local host uh, 5984. Yeah, 5984. So I'll do that. Okay, so now I have a tunnel set up. And you can actually test this as working by going to 
my local host, 6984 underscore utils, that should give us, and that gives us CouchDB. Okay, so I actually, okay, I have CouchDB 2.0 set up. Awesome. With, uh, uh, I was kind of hoping it'd be an admin party mode, John. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know if these tests will work if they're not, if it's not an admin party. Because um, it does create and delete databases on the fly. Uh, so, yeah. Unless you want to send me, maybe you privately sent me the, the username and password. Although that, that wouldn't be a good idea because I would just see it on the screen and then anyone could see it. Um, but if you could just put it in admin party mode and then like just destroy. It. I don't know. I don't know what this machine is, but it, if you can just destroy it afterwards, we should be good. Nobody on stream go into this thing and mess with this Couch TV, please. I would really appreciate it. I needed to run these tests. You know, if, 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 if I was smarter or more prepared about this, I would have set up CouchDB2 in advance because I, I really wanted to solve this particular issue. Uh, okay, cool. We're in admin party mode. Free digital ocean. Okay, sweet. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to guess this is an admin party mode. So let's just start using it. So I can rerun these tests. Uh, the test, it's set up, so it talks to you. Okay, it's already talking to localhost 6984. Let's rerun these tests. Okay. So now it should be talking to Jan's machine that he set up for me, um, which all the tests are failing, so that's a bad sign. Huh. 6984 underscore utils. Hmm. Is my. Well, let's do a quick, uh, let's just see if CouchDB is up. OK, it's not up. Um, fresh, not free. Oh, OK. All right. Well, I'm not going to use it too much, Jan. Don't worry. It's not going to cost you a lot of money. But for some reason, OK. So it is running at localhost 1594. OK, that's, I believe that's how I set up my tunnel with dash L. Let me double check. So dash L. 6984 on this machine to localhost 5984. You know, I'll do this just in case. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, sweet. All right, awesome. Okay, so now let's rerun these tests. Database encountered an unknown error. Uh, oh, we have to enable cores. That's okay. I know how to do that. Um, oh, actually, here's a little trick. I added this recently. Um, if you install the latest version of add cores to CouchDB, it actually supports CouchDB2 now. So it just it detects whether the CouchDB is CouchDB1 or CouchDB2, and then it makes the necessary changes to enable cores. Um, and it just it sets up cores with like just the any anybody can access it. So it's like it's not it's not great from a security point of view, but it's good for hacking around, which is exactly what we're doing today. So let's just do it. We'll do add cores to CouchDB, um, and then we have to pass in, uh, how do we set this up? All right, URL. So I'll just pass in HTTP 127.0.0.1, uh, 1694, and that should work. Got a 404. Huh. OK, well, I can just do it manually. I'm not sure what's going on here, but um, dang. I, I swear this thing was working. This, this project even has tests now. I went in and I added tests. So I'm not sure why that's not working, but it's okay. Um, let's go in and configure it. Uh, oh, I'm running a cluster with three nodes. Huh. Uh, oh, maybe this is why it's not working, because it's a cluster of three nodes. I usually, oh, I think my tool might only work when it's in the admin party please mode. Yeah. Um, well, I can set okay. I can set up a cores proxy in front of this. That's probably the easiest thing to do. I know that that way. I don't want to ask Yon to do a whole bunch of work for me. But, um, if I can, I, if I can avoid bugging him too much. Underscore node uh, like this. Oh yeah, it's like node and then like oh yeah, you can get the list of them right. It's like. Um, Hang on a sec. Uh, I actually I figured out how to do this, Jan. I did uh, in the 
Add course to Koshi project. Um, I know I did figure out how to do this. You have to check, okay, so when you're doing Couch TV 2, you have to check uh, underscore node, yeah, but you have to figure out what the names of the nodes are, which you get from. Cluster nodes. Uh, what is this? Oh, membership. Right, I remember this now. Yeah. So you do underscore membership. Okay, now we have the names of all the nodes. Who's tweeting at me? Anybody tweeting at me? Okay. If you, if, if you want to tweet at me, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions here, in the stream, uh, chat, or wherever. Um, okay, so we got, we got nodes. Uh, okay, so... Let's do a node one at. So if I just pass this in, that should actually give me is it underscore node. I'm not super familiar with uh, CouchDB2, I gotta admit. Um, I haven't played around with it nearly as much as I'd like to. Um, cluster nodes. Okay, you know, I'm just gonna set up a course proxy. Let's just do this. I know that, I think Gregor wrote the co the course proxy, like the course proxy. Yeah, he did. Um, I think it works with the command line. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you should be able to just, okay, npm install g course proxy, okay. Yeah, so apparently there's a bug in add cores to CouchDB, because it should just work. Like. My goal with that project was it, it should not take a lot of effort to configure cores in CouchDB. Actually, honestly, if it were my choice, I would say that CouchDB should just come with cores enabled uh, by default. I know it's a, I know it has security implications, but I mean, we already start in admin party mode. I feel like it would be, you know, it just helps people get started. Like, people always struggle with, with cores whenever they get started with CouchDB and CouchDB. And look at me struggling with it right here. Um, anyway, so we got cores proxy. Um, and so I should be able to point it to, okay, um, okay, so it's going to run at 1337, and then I want to point it to, okay, how do I point it to, okay, what, well, so wait a minute, how does this work? How do I point it to another HTTP server? Oh, admin party is going away. Yeah. I, I would love for it to be a single button press. Yeah, that would be really, really convenient. Um, this course proxy that Gregor wrote. Uh, oh, I see how he has it set up. Oh, okay, that's really clever. Okay, so, I, okay, I got it. All right, actually, this is really nice because it's just zero configuration. So the way this should work is I should just run just run cores proxy. Now we have uh, 1337. That's really funny. Very leet, Gregor. I like that. And then you just pass in the URL after that. So if I pass in this, for instance, this should be all cores proxied. That should be the way that works. Um, no, it's not. Oh, I have to URL encode everything. OK, so let's URL encode this. Is that what I have to do? No. Oh, I see. Okay, without the HTTP. Okay. RTFM, right. Always make sure it's RTFM, folks. It's very, very important. 1337 slash this. Get rid of the HTTP. It's not necessary. Do this. Okay. All right. Why did it redirect me? Okay. Well, it redirected me, which is kind of annoying. But for the purposes of testing, it's not going to matter. So in this test, I want to point it to HTTP 1337 slash uh, localhost again, 6984. Okay, so now it should actually run against this CouchDB2 with cores in it. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, okay, awesome. So this is exactly what I hoped to see. So the point of this test, the, the point of this entire test was to demonstrate that, as this person said, they wrote three tests, and the first two failed, and the one in the middle was fine. When you run those exact same tests against CouchDB2, it passes. So this is kind of like, this describes a lot of a lot of the work that I do, especially with CouchDB, is that like, I'm basically just writing to the gold standard of CouchDB. 
So oftentimes I'm just writing a test, I'm running it against CouchDB, I'm running it against CouchDB, I'm seeing what CouchDB says. If I say anything different, I am wrong. And that makes it super, super simple to solve these bugs. So in this case, when you pass in a null value, um, CouchDB does the right thing. It understands that, that, um, that you are actually searching for uh, a null value. Hey, hey, Julia, how's it going? Um, whereas CouchDB is not. So that's good. That means this is a true bug. It is truly something that I want to solve. So now the question is just how to fix it. So uh, the next trick that we want to do is we want to just run one test at a time. So let's just run this one test. And OK, so we got a failure. Ah, uh, that's kind of annoying. It's running two tests whereas I really only wanted to run one. So I'm just going to go back into this person's test, and I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to go back into this file, test.eq.js, test.eq.js. I'm going to go in, and I'm just going to add another string to this test they added so that I can easily grep it. I'll just say 170-1. So now I can test 170-1. Uh, it should have a unique name, so... Hasn't updated yet, but it doesn't matter. Uh, come on. Oh, I see what happened. No, I got to go back. Okay. Yeah, making unique names for tests, especially in Mocha, is really, really convenient. Okay, so let's do. Oh, I named the wrong one. Oh, but it doesn't matter. That actually still makes it easy. So I'm just going to run this one test. Okay, so we've got a failing test. So it says, can I use in operator search for not equal and null? So we actually got an error. And the error was at test bundle.js 2444. So unfortunately, Mocha reports this on the bundle, whereas this does have source maps. So if you go in here, you should see, yeah, you'll see source maps. So um, we can go and look at test bundle 2444, but Chrome will try to redirect us to the bundle since it's a source map. So what I like to do in this case, honestly, is I just I don't use Chrome to check this because it's just too inconvenient. Because Chrome it, it slows down really hard if you try to open a big bundle file. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the okay. I'm going to go to the PouchDB find directory. I'm going to look at test slash test bundle.js, and I'm just going to instantly go to this line two four 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 to see what this is. Okay. Okay, and I found what it is, and I'm just going to find it in the source. There's probably a faster way to do this, but um, I really don't know one off the top of my head. So. And it's going to find where in the actual source it is. OK, it's in utils.js. So now let's look at utils.js. Uh, if, if you hit Command-O and, and you're not in the DevTools, it opens up a file. Kind of annoying. But if you hit Command-O in the DevTools, it'll open it up. So now I can start typing utils.js. And then we will find okay, this utils.js file, which should be the one I'm looking for. There should be should be able to see the code, see where the error came from before. Oh, this is the wrong utils.js. This is the problem with naming everything utils.js. Yeah, like, um, geez, where is this thing? Lib abstract map reduce, is that where it is? What's the path on this thing? Lib adapters local, okay. Lib adapters local utils, okay. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this like new convention in JavaScript of like having like a lot of paths and then having everything called index.js or everything called component.js or whatever. Like then when you're searching in Chrome, it's really tough because every file has exactly the same name. They just have or more or less, they just have different paths. So I don't know. I kind of went with that style for this project and now it's sort of biting me. But you know, that's how it goes. So I wonder how many people are in the stream. I check real quick. Sixteen, cool. Okay. Well, hi everybody. Um, if any of this is getting too deep in the weeds and you're you're not interested, then I, I'm happy. Like I'm happy to hear suggestions about like. I mean, I, I'm trying to deep dive into one single issue, hopefully, and, and resolve it. But I can also just kind of skim over my issues because I mean, I got seventy of these to go through, and it's gonna, <laughs> it's probably gonna take uh, quite some time. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yana, Yana agrees with me about unique names in JavaScript. Yeah. I think more and more I'm starting to realize it's just it's the way to go, um, especially when you start moving to like ES6. I don't know if any any of y'all noticed this, but 
um, when you use ES6 modules in rollup specifically, it doesn't understand that index.js is a magical thing. Like, in fact, index.js is not a magical thing per the ES6 module spec. And so rollup implements that spec exactly as is. Whereas I think Babel, when it, um, when it processes ES6 modules, it's a lot looser about it. And it lets you get away with saying, like, like saying import foo when you really meant foo slash index.js. Anyway, so another reason not to just name everything index.js. But um, yeah. Is it, sometimes these conventions get baked in, and then they just become muscle memory, and then we're stuck with them. You know? So anyway, so uh, the error was being thrown. I think it was here, right? Search for not equal in null. OK, so it was this thing. This thing ended up being null. So now if I just refresh this, I should be able to reproduce. And we should have this matcher. Should be, yeah, this matcher is null. So actually, I think, oh, you know what? Uh, huh. So OK. So the matcher should literally be null. That is actually what it should be. It's, it's intended to be null. We're searching for the string null. So I thought. I thought the type of null was object. So I'm kind of surprised it didn't go in the other. Yeah, so why didn't it go down the other code path? Oh, not equals equals object. OK, I see what's going on. So yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at this code, so it's kind of unfamiliar to me. This is basically building up a query selector for Mango, which is the new query language in TypeDB2, and also the one used in TypeDB Find. And I think what it's doing is it's basically just normalizing this. And oh yeah, I remember this. Yeah, so it's yeah, so it's like yeah, you can kind of there's kind of like a shorthand form for these these queries. Like you can say like um, foo bar, like foo colon bar, and that means when foo equals bar. So it's like um, so it's like these two queries are the same. Like you can say foo bar. Like passing in this query is the same thing as passing in foo uh, e equals bar. I think Mongo does the same thing. Anyway, so what this method is doing, massage selector, is just massaging it, right? It's just kind of taking the, the shorthand form and making it the normalized form. So in this case, if you pass in foo null, or foo not equal to null, then it should end up being, OK. I see what's going on here. I think I should say if type of matcher not equals equals object and matcher not equal null. I think that's the fix here. I think what we're actually looking for here is a true object. Whereas null is the only thing that's not like it's not really an object in like the common parlance of the term. And and so it's really like this is a common JavaScript mistake to make. I've made this mistake many, many times. Um, this is probably I mean here I here I made this mistake again. Well, it might have been Garrett who made this mistake. I don't know. I'm not going to get blame. I don't want to blame anybody right now. Somebody somebody forgot that null is an object, uh, and it could very well have been me. But um, let's try to fix this. So I'm just going to do the, the quickest possible fix. And I'm going to say if type of match or not, uh, not equals object, and, uh, or let's say, or matcher equals equals null, right? I think that's what we're going for here. Yeah, I think that is what this is supposed to be. So uh, let's see if that fixes that. Error, and if not, um, we'll keep hunting. OK, it actually fixed it. Sweet. That's what I figured it was. Yeah. Um, so right now, the test is verifying that we do exactly the same thing as CouchDB, which is great. Um, so let's go back, and let's look at all six tests. And let's see if, uh, you know, fingers crossed, they just are all fixed now, which, um, you know, sometimes you get lucky. You never know. Um, I'm at the wrong URL. So let's go. OK, this is the right URL, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so the third one is not working. But OK, so all right, one down, one left to go. So we're not doing too bad. Which editor do you use that doesn't show you the path? Um, well, hey, Max. Uh, well, I'm using WebStorm. And it's true, it, it, well, it actually does show you the path. So WebStorm is actually pretty smart about this, but only in certain cases. Maybe it's configurable to make it otherwise, but I'll, I'll show you an example. If you open up two files with the same name, like, uh, so I open up, uh, sorry, my editor is going kind of slow because I'm running many things at once. Um, just, it's kind of frozen right now, just give it a sec. So if I open up another file called utils.js, like, uh, yeah, see, notice that it actually shows like for he, like here it shows the the slash 
because it knows that, that there's, a lot to, there's a lot of ambiguity here. Whereas for this one, it doesn't, because for this file, there's no ambiguity. So WebStorm, like here, I'll zoom in so you, so you can see that, right? So for the one that's unambiguous, it's not showing the path. For the one that's ambiguous, it is showing the path. So it's actually pretty good about it, but regardless, when I'm in Chrome, I find I, I constantly get confused because it doesn't do that. And I'm, I'm constantly debugging in Chrome, so that's really annoying, you know? So, um, yeah, okay. Jan says TextMate only shows the file name in the tab. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no one true solution to this problem, right? It's, it's just kind of, it's just kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> Bulos. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I, I, I know Bulos. I, I really should be out in the sun instead of coding. But I have a lot of issues to get through. And, you know, I did go out in the sun today. I went out for a jog this morning in Port Green, and it was beautiful out there. So, um, but, yeah, if, if you can out there, if you can get out there and enjoy the sun, this is the first sun that New York has seen in, in quite some time. It feels like it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, YouTube takes a while to process the video, but it should be, um, but it should be ready uh, within a day. Anyway, so let's not argue about paths, path naming in JavaScript. Let's go back and fix this bug. I actually feel like we're really close. So I fixed the first one, the second one was already fixed, and the third one is not passing. Um, so it looks like this selector didn't work. Multiple null values. Uh, oh, I think, okay, so let's go back and look at this test exactly. So, all right, here's the test. Of this because I don't need this anymore. Here's the test. Uh, does queries with multiple null values. So, oh, okay. So this is checking for uh, field one null and field and field two null. So it's working when you pass in one. Wait, actually, what is the difference between the test that's passing and the test that's not passing? Let's see. So the test that's passing, he's doing selector field one null. Okay, that makes sense. And then for the test that's not passing, he's saying, okay, field one null, field two null. Okay, that makes sense. So the way that um, the way that Mango's queries work is that um, when you when you uh, when you do a selector on two fields like this, yeah, when you do a selector on two fields like this, and you have an index on what did you, what did this what is the index on? And the index is only on one. Yeah. So we're searching on two fields. There's only an index on one field. So what it actually does under the hood is it does an on-disk query for the first field, and then the second field it filters in memory. So this is kind of like what, um, like, like try to imagine what uh, like SQL would do if you said like um, select star where foo equals whatever and bar equals whatever, and there's only an index on foo, then it'll still look up bar for you, but it'll do it in memory. Well, that's what this is doing. So probably the issue here is that we have different logic for the in-memory selector than the on-disk selector. And I believe I can find that right here, in-memory filter. So undoubtedly this in-memory filter is just not checking null versus undefined or something. Um, it's almost undoubtedly that's the case. So yeah, so I think I can just set a breakpoint here and I can probably figure it out. So let's go in and I'm just gonna run this one test, just the test that's failing. What? I mean, util is not defined. How did I break that? Did I did I type something? Oh, I must have. No, um, I was probably trying to open something, and then my editor like froze, and yeah, that looks like I typed in something. Thank you, WebStorm. I still like WebStorm. I'm not gonna talk. I'm not gonna talk smack about WebStorm. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorites. Okay, so while we wait for Watchify to fix that. Okay, so Watchify has fixed that. Um, okay, cool. So, all right, so we got an, uh, a failing test, good. I was going to set a breakpoint on the file in memory filter, right? Let's go to in memory filter, and let's set a breakpoint, I think this is the area, if I remember correctly, where it checks for a bunch of types. I think I want to check for case null. So let's look for case null, and I think, I think this is where I want to go. Let's just, let's see what happens. It should pass this to the, oh. Oh, we didn't even go into the in-memory filter. Okay, that's uh, that's a bad sign. So why would that happen? Well, let's see. 
Let's see how this filter in memory fields gets used. I think, where does that get used? Um, let's see, find usages, which you can do in WebStorm with Command Shift G, which is kind of nice. So yes, I can see that there's an export here, um, and it should. It usually it usually finds when it's being used, but in this case it didn't, unfortunately. So I'll just say Command Shift G on this file, and it should be able to find where it's imported at least. Yeah. So here's where it got imported, and then. Here's where it's being used. Yeah, so I'm just doing Command Shift G everywhere to uh, to find this. Okay, so all right, so okay, this is the part of the query plan where it says, okay, um, do I need to do? I, I I fetched everything from disk using the on disk query. Do I need to fetch anything in memory? And that's where it figures this out. So what I'm guessing is that this ends up being false somehow. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint here. I'm just gonna search for this. This is in find slash index .js. Lovely. Every, everything is index.js, right? We love index.js. Everything in the world should be named index.js, right? Um, this this is a yeah. So Max is asking me what kind of machine I have. This is a late 2013 MacBook Air, actually, and yeah, it's it's doing fine. It's running LCAP. I recently upgraded to LCAP, um, and it's doing pretty okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm not running a whole lot of processes. I'm using this, and for streaming, I'm using this thing called OBS. It's this open source um, streaming software. Really nice. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's handling this like a champ. It's doing pretty well. And my ISP hasn't cut me off yet either, which is even more amazing, because I'm on like Time Warner. I'm like, I think I'm on like the cheapest plan. I don't remember exactly, but I probably am. So anyway, so let's go in. And let's find, uh, I was going to go to index.js, and I was going to see uh, in memory filter. Okay, so here's the point where I, okay, let's see if this ends up being true or false. Okay, do I have in memory fields? I do. So it should be doing an in memory, wait. Oh, this, oh, this resolves to one, it's not in memory fields. Okay, so it should be doing in memory fields at this point. Okay, yeah, it does it here. So let's continue to here. Okay, and it should have, yes, so it should be doing in memory fields. Yeah, field two is in memory, so that's what it should be doing. So uh, this is where it should be filtering in memory. Let's just walk in. Okay, res okay, rows equals rows dot filter. So that's going to filter the incoming rows, and it should be trying to find. It's trying to find things where field two is null. So here in both in this case, I have two documents, and field two is null in one of them. Okay, so at the end of this, the rows should have a length of one. So let's run it. And the rows have a length of zero, so that means that this rows dot filter already failed, um, which means that I should probably step back in and just like go to this point and see why this messed up. So let's actually just refresh the whole thing and go back in there. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Continue. Okay, so now it's it's creating a row filter at this point. So, um, sorry, I'm gonna move my, I'm gonna move my window up a little bit, because I think my face is down here, right? And so I don't want my face to block anything. Um, yeah, my face takes up quite a bit, yeah, right there. Um, okay, so let's see. So so we're creating a row filter, okay, based on this row.doc selector and the in-memory fields. And now here's the doc where the field two is null. Okay, so this is the one where it should return, it should return true. It should, or no, it should return false. It should say I was not filtering. So let's open up the console. Let's see what's going on here. Um, so it returns false, which is not correct, right? Because, yeah, because, okay, yeah, because the filter function should return true for any items in that list that should be retained. So this document should be retained because field two is null, which is what we're searching for. So it's not. So this is the bug. This function should return true, it's returning false. So let's just go inside of it and see why it's returning false. So we have in memory fields dot every function field matcher equals selector. Let's just go. Uh, let's continue here. Okay, matcher equals selector sub field. Okay. All right, we have field two. Uh, field two equals null. Okay, yeah, that's exactly what it should be. So here's the matcher. The matcher is field two should equal null. The field is we have this function called parsed field. Let's just see what is a parsed field. Field. Okay, sure. Um, and this doc field value. 
get field from doc, and then if okay if is combinational field okay all right I don't think this is a combinational field yeah okay return match selector okay so here's the function let's go into this okay if not matcher no the matcher is there so it continues okay um okay return object dot keys matcher dot every user operator okay let's go in here continue here okay so we have user operator matcher okay so this value should become null okay so the user's document says null and the selector says null so that and that so null is null so it should it should return true so what we're going to do is we're going to say if not matches dot user operator ah okay Man, wait is that no that's not going to throw an error that's not going to bug okay match okay return geez this is just like this is like turtles all the way down right like who who wrote this code <laughs> what were they thinking this is so confusing um okay all right so we have return field exists ah okay that's the bug right so we said equals null, and part of the equals null check is checking whether the field exists, which in this case, it actually doesn't matter if the field exists, because if the field's null, that's okay. What we really want to check is if the field is undefined as opposed to null. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the problem with this bug is that this kind of signals to me that this whole field exists function is based on a lie, like it's, it's wrong. And so I, what I kind of want to do is I kind of want to change it everywhere. Like I want to just go into field exists and change it so that it doesn't return false for null. But then I feel like I should probably go back and fix all the other tests for all these other things because they're all using field exists. Um, so I should probably add more tests. But in the meantime, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to fix, I'm just going to do what I, what I think is the correct solution, at least to fix this particular bug. So right here, field exists should really just check whether it's undefined, should not check if it's null. That's not actually part of the deal. Yeah. So let's go in, and that is in inventoryfilter.js. Um, okay. And, okay, so it's called field exists. Okay, so this function should just return if it's not undefined. Okay, so now let's see. And I see and see already I can see that I'm introducing bugs in other areas like um, this thing, I think this other function really does need to know whether it's null or not. Because I think if you do null instance of array, it actually just throws an error. Oh no, it's actually it's fine. So actually that should be okay. Wait, this is this is actually wrong though field is array. We should probably use the is array module for this because I think I don't think this is right. I think this will break in some browsers. Okay, so I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna fix that while I'm at it. So uh, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna uh, add is array which is like a one-line function. I think it's one of those Sindri Soros functions. It's like super super small, right? Um, I'm just gonna use it here because this is really like, this is what I should be using to check if something is an array, right? Um, okay, let's go in and do that. So, field is array. Instead of that, let's use is array. Because I think it's more subtle than that. Um, it depends on the browser. Okay, so, var is array equals require is array. Should be saved now. Okay. So, uh, while I'm waiting for that to recompile, let's see if anyone has anything to say in chat. <laughs> Needs like that. Yeah, no, this is that's, that's one of those famous famous functions, right? It was like um, one of those famous one-liners that people thought was ridiculous. But if you look at it, like honestly, it has some some subtle knowledge in there that like not everybody knows. I I could not read it off the top of my head. I I vaguely remember what it looks like. I think you have to call two string, and then check if the two string is like object array with like square brackets or something. But I don't remember it off the top of my head. You know, no one, no one can remember this stuff off the top of our head. Uh, let me look it up right now, actually. What? Why do I want to need authorization for the contain? That was weird. Um. Anyway, let's look at the code for isarray. 
Yeah, see, there, there's no way I would remember, I would know this by heart. Like, look at that. Yeah. So, all right. I'm glad to outsource that knowledge to someone else, you know? All right, so let's go back to this. Okay, so now the tricky part. First, we check to make sure that those six tests, those new tests, are passing. They should be passing now. Okay. All right. Now the question is, do we break anything else? Which... Really, you have to run the full test suite to figure that out, I would say. Yeah, I would say that's the next test, because um, you know, maybe me subbing in is array uh, broke something else, or maybe that, you remember what I was saying about um, field exists? Like, maybe that whole null undefined distinction actually matters in other cases, and this is going to reveal where it matters. But we're going to find out very soon. So yeah, see, look, there are failures. So it's already failing. OK, so okay, field is array is not. Oh, OK. I probably had multiple usages of it that I didn't catch. So this is my bad. So let's look for field is array. Yeah, OK. I made a mistake. So that should just be is array. So OK. Am I using this anywhere else? No. OK, so let's go back and just rerun the whole test suite. Um, and it should be enough to run half the test suite. We don't actually have to wait for the other half because I only changed the local stuff. Like I didn't change any of the way that it, inter it interacts with CouchDB. So the first half of the test suite is all local. It's all CouchDB. And the second half of the test suite is CouchDB. So I'm just going to wait for the first 50% to complete, especially because the second 50% is going to be the slowest because it's just slower to access a remote server somewhere than to use like the, the built-in storage in the browser. right? doesn't matter how fast your connection is. It's just going to be faster. So let's run the first 50%. Um, let's check chat to see if I'm missing anybody. Nope. OK. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Benjamin. OK, so let's keep going. So I'm going to just make sure that all the tests are passing. And then, OK, so it looks like they're all going to pass. And now the next step is, in my opinion, there are not enough tests here. Because um, as I was saying before, I changed something in how that uh, field is undefined function works in various places. And yet, you know, it didn't change the behavior before or after of the test. So that signals to me that, um, that the tests are kind of incomplete. So I'm going to stop running the tests. Um, so at this point, I'm looking at where field exists is used, and I see it's used for all these different operators. So I think the, the, the trick here to make sure this is working correctly is I want to do an in-memory filter for each of these things. So I need to do it for regex, min, in, not equal, and mod. Um, and I suspect, oh man, this is actually, this would actually take quite a few tests, I would say, to get this right. This is going to be kind of tricky. So, um, uh, should I do this on stream or should I go through my other issues? What do you all think? I'm going to try to do it on stream. Let's just add a bunch of tests. So, what I typically do in these cases is I just copy paste the existing tests and I just add more. So, I want to test. Uh, I want to test field to, uh, let's do greater than equal to null as well. So all I did was I changed field to equals null to field to greater than or equal to null, which is the same test. So this test should give exactly the same, exactly the same result. So I'm going to search for, uh, okay, I'm going to grep for 170 so I can just do all these tests. And if it gives, okay, wait, what happened? Oh, that, that actually might be a spurious failure. That's probably because I was it was deleting the database when I refreshed. Um, oh, and also I messed up again. That should be an ampersand, not a question mark. OK. Oh, well, actually, it failed in both, which is weird. But well, I guess I'm giving the same result as CouchDB, so I suppose that's correct. But that feels wrong to me. Like this. Um, yeah, field 2 is greater than or equal to null, right? How? Like, here we have field 2 null. Here we have field 2 greater. Did I get the order mixed up? Is it greater than or equal to no. null? 
No, that should be... Wait, that's weird. Did I just find a bug in Couch TV? I feel like that's a bug. No, it's not telling me whether it's a bug or not. It feels kind of like a bug. Yeah, because if I put equals null, it'll pass, right? And if I change that to greater than or equal to, it fails. That sounds like a bug. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely a bug. Huh. Okay, well that's unfortunate because that means that I need to file this bug on CouchDB itself. Um, either that or I'm just like not thinking right. Huh. That is really weird. What if I do less than or equal to? What happens then? That's. It might not have refreshed, you know. And now it passes. What? Why would less than or equal to work, but not greater than? What the? What the heck? Okay. Well, we have a less than or equal to test, so that's pretty good. That's at least a step in the right direction. If we do greater than or equal to null, that should work. Like, why is that not working? That should. That looks fine to me. Dollar sign GTE. Right. Yeah. Anybody caught my bug? Aren't you all paying attention? Catch my bugs for me. Okay. Well, for some reason it's failing. Um, I think I'm just going to mark this as a skip and say uh, to do investigate later. This fails in both couch and pouch, but I believe it shouldn't. Um. Maybe greater than or equal to has a special meaning that less than or equal to does not. Um, well, let's go back. I want to do my due diligence and try to add enough tests. So there's an exist test, which does not use the field exists. It's kind of funky. But equals, we already have a test for that. Uh, do we have a test for not equals? Yeah, I think I think this, this person who opened this pull request already added a not equals test. Yeah, uh, equals null. Did they add a not equal null? No. Okay, so let's add a not equal to null test. So let's add a not equal test. We won't skip it. In this case, if we say not equal to null, then it should give us, it should still give us one result, but the document should be document three, I think. Field one null, field two not null. So it should be two, actually. Okay, so. Let's test this. Um, I think it hasn't updated yet. Okay, so that works. Come on, come on, catch DB, please, please. Okay, sweet. So that's working. Okay, what were the other ones I wanted to test? I wanted to test um, mod in, not in size. Man, this is a this is almost like a, you'd almost think this is a full query language. You'd almost think this is a query language you could actually use for querying. It's got, it's got a lot of fields. Oh man, a ton of fields. I don't know if I want to test all of these. This is a lot of tests to add. Um, but no, let's do due diligence. Let's do in. We did not, let's, let's do mod next. Mod's the next one. So let's do mod. Okay, so we're going to do field uh, one. Let's make it a number so we can actually test mod, right? Um, Okay, so we're going to do field2 mod, uh, how does mod work, actually, I don't even remember, let's look up, uh, cloudant, mango, yeah, the name of the, the name of the language is mango, so, uh, where is the, they, ha they should have a document that just, like, gives the whole API, I don't remember exactly where it is. Let's try Google. Sometimes it's easier to search in Google. I don't remember how mod works. Mod. It should be like the whatever it's called, like the mod, like the I'm drawing it, like the percentage sign, right? Mod. Okay, divisor remainder. So it takes a divisor and a remainder and tells you where the divisor and remainder are both positive integers. Do you have an example of that? How do you pass in two? 
I've just seen an example of this. Actually, let's look at, okay, let's just do the easiest thing. Let's look at um, the existing test for mod. So I can figure out how this is even supposed to work. Oh, I see. It takes an array like that. That makes sense. So like mod 2 equals 0. Okay, that makes sense. So we'll say mod with an array. Uh, mod 1 should be 0. Okay, let's see. So this should come up with, it should give us this one. Okay. So it should give us document with the ID 2. So let's test that. And that passed. Okay, good. Okay, cool. And okay, so let's add some more tests. Uh, I, had a few, I had a few more I wanted to test, right? Mod, in, not in. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, though. I feel like I, I've sufficiently tested this. Because, like, I mean, I could add tests for all these other things, but it looks like the only thing I'm worried about is that this field exists. That you could pass in a null. That you could have a null field. Uh, I see. So actually, what I want to test is I want to test if the existing field is null, and then this would fail. So actually, I'm not even testing the thing I want to test. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot more tests that need to be added here. Okay, so. All right, let me just kind of visually inspect this and see if I think it'll work. So if I, if I make this null, I'm going to do array containing value. Yeah, that'll throw. That'll throw if it's null, definitely. So actually, I think well, what I want to do here is, OK, actually, let's, let's go back a step. So when I look at this field exists thing, it, would, it originally said not equals equals undefined and not null. But for equals, we can check whether something is null. So let's let's just make a different function. Let's call it field is not undefined. Which George Orwell would have a conniption fit about saying not undefined, right? He wrote this whole essay about the politics of the English language, and he said it, it's a horrible practice to say like not un something, right? But but if I said field is defined, that just sounds weird, right? So. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna spit in George Orwell's face. That's what I do every day when I'm writing JavaScript. Just totally throwing away literary conventions. Okay, so field exists. We'll say type of doc field value not equals equals null. Fine, and doc field value not equals equals null. So okay, so that's that's the old behavior. But then for certain fields, we want we actually accept null. In very particular cases. So in the case of equals, we accept that. In the case of greater than or equal to, all of these, it should be exactly the same. We should accept that. Um, for these other ones, for mod, OK, for mod, OK, mod is a number, so it definitely has to be undefined or null, or not undefined and not null, because it should be a number. In is actually the same thing, because it needs to be an array. Not in is the same thing. It needs to be an array. Size is the same thing, because it needs to be an array. Regex should be a string. All should be an array. Type is also a string. No. What is type? It's like type of, right? Yeah, it's also, also a string. So OK. So yeah, so we should only really modify that one thing. So I'm just going to add one test to make sure that this does the correct thing, which I'm going to, the way I'm going to test this, I'm just going to test this in the case of mod. So I'm just going to make sure that if Okay, so I'm just going to make sure that if everything's null, let's just make everything null, okay? No numbers anywhere to be seen. And you try to do mod, okay? So if that's the case, you should get back an empty list, because there's no numbers here. There's just none. So this should be an empty list. Um, and it should not throw an exception is, is the crucial thing. So let's, uh, let's test that. Okay, this should give the same result in all... OK, cool. So that worked. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick test to make sure that I didn't break anything else. And I, I'm going to call this good, because I mean, you know, I could add a bunch more tests here. Like, really, this thing needs lots and lots of tests. Really, there should be tests for every single kind of query operator. There should be tests for every single case of, like, like, like picture a matrix in your head of, like, or, or a table. Picture a table in your head of, like, uh, query selectors and possible values, like null, undefined, empty array, empty object, full object, full array, an array with null in it. Like, 
like really there should be tests to fill up every single spot in that table. But um, but I think for the purposes of this stream, for this stream, I've already spent enough time on this issue, and um, and I mean this adequately addresses the issue that the person raised, and it fixes it, and it adds some new tests to boot. So I think we can declare victory in this for now. The goal of writing new tests, like there are, you should always be writing new tests. I and uh, that's just an ongoing battle. With um, oh, Jan says they're 20, 30 seconds behind. Oh, sorry about that. Well, uh, I mean, I, I'm coming back here and I'm checking every once in a while. So, um, yeah, so I, I'll at least give you, you know, I can at least talk to you. I guess I'm, I'm speaking to you from the future now. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but no worries. Okay, so, yeah, feel free to ping me whenever. Anyway, okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, we've just verified that the tests are passing, and it's starting to run the tests against... Uh, Jan's couch TV instance. Thank you, Jan. I appreciate that very much. But we actually don't need this anymore. I'm satisfied. I'm pretty sure this is going to work. So uh, what I can do now is uh, I have the person's pull request checked out. Um, I can log out of Jan's server. Thank you, Jan. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I made a bunch of changes and uh, I'm going to just add another commit on top of this one. And our convention is typically to do uh, to mention the number somewhere in the commit message. So I'll just say uh, fix the null issue. Um, fix, fix the null equals not equal issue. So OK. And then I'm going to make a pull request out of this. But first, what I'm going to do just to be certain is I'm going to run a lint on it. Uh, which I think in this project is JS hint, yeah. Just to make sure I didn't forget a semicolon or something. Because it's really annoying when you make a pull request and then you push it out, and you're like, yay, I'm all good to go, and then you check back a day later, and you're like, oh, right, semicolon. But this seems to be working, and there's nothing else I can think of that I need to check before doing a pull request. Let's just do a pull request. OK, so I'm going to do hub pull request. Um, Wait a minute, it's not working. Oh, I think I have to push it. Hang on a sec. So I'm going to push it to, I'm just going to create a new branch called this. I, you have to push before you can do a pull request. Um, so OK, then I'm going to say, OK, 169, uh, fix null. I'm just going to copy this, actually. This isn't good. OK. And then I'm going to say, uh, OK, following up on this issue. 170, OK. Uh, following up on 170, this adds the necessary changes to fix the issue, as well as um, adding some new tests to verify that everything is hunky dory. Uh, note the new is array dependency, which I added because we used to have our own array check, but it's safer to use a community maintained one. Don't listen to the haters after the whole left pad debacle. Do not listen to them. It is true. It is better to use a community maintained module, even if it's one line. The whole issue with left pad was that they unpublished. That was the issue. All right. Well, the issue was unpublishing, which actually has been fixed. I actually tried to unpublish a module recently. I have my reasons. Don't worry about it. No one was actually using this thing. I just made a typo. And they actually didn't let me from the command line. I was really surprised. And I had to email them, and I had to email NPM to get uh, to get the, the rights to unpublish. Because even though no, nobody was using it, like, well, it seemed to me like nobody was using it. But maybe they, you know, maybe they were able to see, like, private repos, and they thought someone was using it. I don't know. Anyway. Um, I had to actually make special request, make a special request to get it unpublished. So npm has changed their policy on this, which is good. Um, but yeah, the issue was unpublishing, and also the I mean the other issue is like trusting people. Like you know, use modules from people you trust. And like in the case of is array, like it's not so much even that I necessarily super duper trust whoever wrote it because I actually don't know who wrote it. But it's more like I know that is array is used by tons and tons and tons of modules. So 
if it breaks, I mean, I'm going to hear about it on the evening news. You know, I'm not going to hear about it because my service went down and my service was the canary in the coal mine. You know, look, 200,000 downloads each month. Like, you know, like, if this gets unpublished or if the person who's maintaining it, you know, introduces spyware or whatever into it, like, like we're all going to find out together, you know. This is how open source works. You have to trust people at the end of the day. Like, it's about people. You have to trust people. Like, most humans are basically good, in my experience. So, um, you should trust them. So, open the pull request. Um, I'm just going to take a look at what it looks like. Hub has this thing called Hub Browse, which is really nice. Because um, it just opens it up. And oh, I thought it opened up the pull request. That's okay. It doesn't. But let's look at this pull request. So... Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it opens okay. So the important thing about opening the pull request is now it's going to run the tests. And I already have the tests set up to actually like run CouchDB, test against CouchDB, test against various browsers. So it's doing that right now, and I can just kind of wait. And so uh, I'll check back in with that later. But it looks like I actually fixed it, which um, I'm pretty happy about. This is probably the first commit I have made to CouchDB find in months. So uh, yeah, I should. It, it's good that I'm streaming, because this is giving me motivation to actually go in and, and do more work on this stuff. Um, so I'm enjoying this. Yeah. OK, so let's keep trucking through. So uh, I'm just going to quickly look at a bunch of closed issues, because I just want to quickly review them and make sure that everything is copacetic. Um, it looks like Dale already handled most of these. Yeah, uh, OK. Yep, that sounds reasonable. OK. Um, yep, OK. This person closed their own issue, so I'm going to assume that they fixed their problem. So um, I guess he must have figured it out, so I'm not going to respond. Um, oh, same here. OK, reading more carefully, I found this. OK, and that's perfectly fine. If you make an issue, and then it's a question, and you figure it out on your own, then yeah, just close it. That's fine. I can just glance at this, and it doesn't take up too much time. It's fine. Um, looks like Dale already merged this. Dale merged that. Um, that was a doc change. Looks like it got merged. Cool. That was the same thing. That was the issue I was looking at before. OK, so let's just keep looking for more issues. This one I was actually looking into yesterday. This is for local forage. Let's see. I'm curious. I, I, I ended up closing it because I thought maybe like maybe there's no point in adding built-in support for the SQLite plugin to local forage. But I wanted to get uh, Theodorus's feedback on this. Maybe, maybe he does think it would be a good feature. We'll find out. We'll see. Oh, shit. Yeah, I, I broke my coffee pot a while ago, and so the spout is all messed up now. So unfortunately, it tends to, to drip when it pours. It's too bad. But it's OK. Just a minor spill. The hazards of doing programming, right? I mean, my, my life is so hard. I had to deal with spilled coffee all the time. Don't try this at home, kids. It's a dangerous job. OK, so uh, let's see what people in chat are saying. <laughs> Inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're talking about my little rant about left pad and not about the coffee fiasco. Okay. Oh, cool. So he's actually maintaining it. That's good. I, I didn't want to maintain this after myself, to be honest. So I'm glad that he is. Um, okay. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm going to answer his question.
Yeah. So uh, when I wrote SQLite plugin two, one of the things I really wanted to do is I wanted to make it really, really compatible with Web SQL, and not try to make it its own thing that had a, a you know a bunch of bells and whistles and stuff. Because I really just wanted a polyfill for Web SQL. So I tended to make the API really, really forgiving. Um, actually, I'm going to specify here. Um, that said, it also fully supports the normal Web SQL API. So you can also just pass in whatever you would have passed into window.opendatabase. Uh, let's see. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for SQLite plugin one. Um, actually, I'm not going to say that. I don't like to make value judgments about other people's software if I can avoid it. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna fork a project, like don't don't talk smack about the original project, or at least like try to keep the smack talk to a minimum. Like, yes, you need to like go out there and kind of market and promote your thing. And yes, you're going out there and you're implicitly saying my thing is better, use my thing. But there are ways to be classy about it. Like, um, um, yeah. So not the I'm just gonna say not the case with SQLite plugin one. You have to specify location as of the uh, most recent version. Yeah, so I'm just going to be neutral about it. Like, there are good examples of people forking something and being really, like, diplomatic and classy about it. Like, uh, Rich Harris wrote this thing recently that I thought was really cool. It has a great name. Um, Buble. Yeah. Which is uh, basically his fork of Babel. Like, he just kind of, he just kind of rewrote Babel from scratch, essentially. And his idea was to, like, make a version of Babel that's like um, no configuration, just does ES 2015, and um, like is very, very opinionated and doesn't have a lot of configuration, and is also faster than Babel, supposedly. Um, but I mean, in his, in his guide and his, like, uh, in his explanation for this project, he doesn't talk smack against, against Babel. He says things like, like, OK, like as the name suggests, Buble is heavily inspired by and indebted to Babel. That's beautiful. Like that's a beautiful thing, you know. Like instead of like, um, yeah, instead of like talking a bunch of crap about someone else's module, you need know, to say like, it's inspired by it, you know, um, but it differs from it in these and these ways. He says it's much faster as well. I'd like to see a, um, a benchmark though. To be fair, if you're gonna if you're gonna make claims like that, you should back it up, Rich. I'm gonna bug him next time I see him at Brooklyn JS. But overall, this is a very kind of classy fork, I think. Um, everyone should aspire to be as diplomatic as possible in open source. Um, like, we're not trying to claw our way over everybody else to get to the top, you know? It's not a race. OK, so let's see. Uh, OK, so Dale merged my pull request from yesterday. Cool. Um, oh, shoot. Oh, it looks like, actually, I opened a pull request that uh, might have been superseded by another pull request that, uh, yeah, that, uh, that Gregor added. I didn't even notice this pull request. That was a mistake. So I guess, um, but I think my pull request, I, so he deleted the branch. Oh, because Dale merged it. How did he merge it? Because, like, I think it, I already made that change. If Dale merged my other pull request, what, what happened here? Let's look at the commit history. Yeah, see, he merged it, and it just ended up being an empty commit. So I guess that's OK. Sorry, Gregor, I, I didn't notice your pull request. But for what it's worth, my pull request um, added more ESLint rules, because we weren't just missing the semicolons thing. We were missing lots of things. Like, we were supposed to check for curly braces after if statements, um, spaces after unary operators. So I fixed all those things, too. Um, yeah, I also like went through the code and actually fixed it, which is kind of nice. Anyway, OK, so let's go back through notifications. I'm at 61 now. I started at 70 at the start of the stream. Oh, 59. OK, good. Um, let's see if anyone has any comments about it. If anyone's interested in, like, um, yeah, if anyone's interested in, like, hey, I opened this issue against you, like, three months ago, and you didn't really respond to it, like, now, now is the time. Like, feel free to go into the chat and say, hey, Nolan, can you take a look at this? You know, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to make that point in the chat real quick. 
Hmm. Some reason I can oh, there you go. Okay, so let's keep going down the list. Here's a green keeper issue, so I can easily merge that. Assuming it actually passed. Okay, it did. Cool. And I got the green keeper verified, which, thank you, Gregor, now I know actually means that green keeper did open this request, so I don't even need to look at it, but I will look at it just to be safe. And yeah, it looks cool. Okay, so we're going to merge this. All right. Oh, thanks, Charlotte. I think, Charlotte, you can merge this if you want. Like, um, like if it's... If it looks good to you, and if it's green, then uh, go ahead and merge it. Um, I'm just going to make it match our commit message style. And then we're done. Okay, cool. Uh, next up, what do we got? Oh, this was uh, Mike Hardington at this. Okay. I don't know if he's, he's online right now. I think he said he was going to check on my stream. I'm not sure if he's out there. Um, if you are, hi. Um, let's see. I'm going to look at some more closed issues because I can just usually quickly glance over this. Usually Dale has a good reason when he closes these issues. And so I can typically just kind of trust him. Fix documentation now. Okay, so this fixes the docs. Okay, looks like it was... We'll close this. Okay, cool. It got merged in. Okay, uh, Dale opened this pull request. Ooh, from a long time ago. And it got merged when? Oh, weird. Whoa, that's super weird. Look at that. This is a pull request from 2014. For some reason, Coveralls decided to come in and comment on it. That's weird. Okay. Oh, that's bizarre. I was, I was mentioning yesterday that I really don't like this feature of coveralls. I find it distracting that it even, that it adds a new comment to GitHub. I like it better when it just has a little, like, check mark down below in the, um, in the Travis, or, like, along with the Travis checks and the Greenkeeper checks and everything. So I wonder if I can disable this. I'm actually going to go into coveralls right now and see if I can disable that feature, because I'm not a big fan of that. It's kind of annoying, to be honest. Uh, coveralls is a service that we use to check code coverage, by the way. And it's just, it, it actually does very, very little, honestly. It just kind of reports back a number to us between 0 and 100. That's basically what it does. We're using Istanbul under the hood to check code coverage. That's the main thing that's driving this. So let's go in and see if we can configure it to turn that off, because I'm not a huge fan of that feature. Notifications, maybe it's in here. Hmm. Dang, maybe it's not an option that you can configure. Hmm. They added that feature just recently, and I, I'm really not a big fan, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not seeing where I can actually configure this. Oh, leave comments. No, no thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right, so that's fixed. Good. Uh, I'm going to make a note of it in Slack just because when you change something like that, it's probably good to let everyone else know what's going on. I'm sure Dale will be fine with it. I think Dale... I thought Dale was on vacation. I'm kind of surprised to see him closing pull requests. But maybe he was sneaking in a little bit of time. Anyway, um, okay, this is a much older issue, and I believe this has been fixed. And I guess people are just talking about it. Oh, shoot. Now, this is something that we just changed recently, this rev pose issue. And it looks like it's causing a problem with couch-based light replicator. That's unfortunate. Um... Yeah. Huh. Yeah, to be honest, we don't really we don't really test against couch base or couch base light. Like we, we try to do, you know, good faith effort, but really it's like our policy on that is kind of more like 
if Couchbase wants to fix those issues with integration with us, they can either like make their API work exactly the same as CouchDB because that's our gold standard, or they can come in and fix our, our our project, which like they've done before in the past. Like they've gone in and add, added tests. We even test Couchbase uh, Sync Gateway in CI in continuous integration right now in Travis and. Um, like we we do our we do our best to try to fix those issues, but like, um, I mean, they're a company with the funds to look into this stuff. So, uh, and I don't use Couchbase, so it's it's just kind of like it's not the thing I want to do on the weekend, you know. To be fair, so um, I hope they go in and fix that, but um, I'm not super invested one way or the other, to be honest. How many people do we still have in the, this live thing? Trying to decide how much longer to keep going with this. I feel like I feel like with that first issue, man, like I, I plowed through it, I actually fixed the issue, which was really good. I'm really happy, nine people watching, cool. Um, I'm really happy that I actually managed to plow through the issue, fix it on stream. So now you know how to go in and fix a bug in Pouch to be fine. Uh, and you see my workflow and everything, just for those who are interested. So that's kind of cool. But um, I'm hoping I can get through more issues a little bit more quickly. Um, but it's 4.30 now, they're doing this for an hour and a half. I may stop after like, I don't know, another half hour or so. <clears throat> I think this issue already got fixed in another pull request, yeah. <clears throat> okay, in this issue, I talked about this yesterday, this is that e-tag issue in Safari uh, developer, or Safari technology preview. which um, I filed the bugs on WebKit and on CouchDB, and both of them fixed it, so um, hopefully this will never actually show up in the real world because uh, it only existed in WebKit Nightly, and now it should not exist in Safari when they release, so. It's really important to go in there and actually test um, test the bleeding edge of browsers. Like, I've definitely, I found bugs in, um, in like, Chrome... Chrome Canary and in Firefox Developer Edition. No, actually, I've never, found, I've never found a bug in Firefox. I'm still waiting for the day. Someday I will find a bug in Firefox, but it's so hard because they're so good. They're just, they're always on top of things. It's really frustrating for me. <laughs> I just can't seem to find a bug in Firefox ever. But I definitely have found issues in Chrome Canary, and it's good to, to like be aware of it before it goes live, you know? So, anyway. That's fixed. Uh, this, I believe, was the same issue. Yes, this is the same issue. Okay. Yeah, this is a related issue. Um, yeah. We're still doing cache, uh, we're still doing user agent sniffing to try to detect whether the browser is going to aggressively cache or not. Um, which I don't think we should do. I think we should just do one thing for all the browsers, but it's an open issue. And I think I, I think I opened a separate issue about it, so I'm gonna deal with that later. Documentation change, that was fixed. That was a documentation change, okay, cool. So that, that really feels like progress. Now we're down to 47 issues. Um, let's see the buffer project. I'm always keeping an eye on the buffer project because I'm just kind of interested in what's going on in there. This is a, this is the implementation of buffer that like Browserify and Webpack use in the browser. Um, wasn't this an issue? This was an issue that um, that uh, Faros Bukade, I think he was the one who actually found this issue, right? This is the issue about yeah, about how buffer has this unsafe behavior. Yeah, that's kind of funny. So. Given that he filed this, you'd think he would have already fixed it in Buffer. So my guess is that it must already be fixed. I can't imagine he wouldn't be on top of this. Like, he, he was kind of the instigator for this whole issue. And Buffer is his, yeah, he's aware of what's going on. Although it's hard for me to say, because I don't know. I don't know if he actually made any changes to this function, or to this um, project.
Um, I wonder if I can answer this person's question. I wonder how I, I can even tell. Um, I think that the way I would tell here is Alec unsafe, Alec from. You know what, maybe I shouldn't say anything here, because it's like, Faraz is going to get pinged on this. If he's interested, he can respond. I really don't know the answer to this. So it's probably I'm probably being less than helpful if I go in and like try to talk about a bunch of stuff that I don't know anything about. So I'm just going to leave this, actually. Okay, let's continue looking at some issues. Um, I wanted to get into local NPM at some point, but I, I feel like I need a lot more time to do that. So I'm not sure if I want to do that on stream. Closing a bunch of issues. Uh, let's see. I'm going to close this one probably because this is not my module. I'm sure that yeah, Calvin already handled it. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to glance at something that I think I can maybe maybe handle right off the bat. Here's an interesting one. Live syncing more than five databases. I think that's something that CouchDB does not support very well right now, mostly due to the eight connection limit, which I'm sure that's the first thing. Yeah, it's the first thing. Nick brought it up right here. Yeah, yeah, it's six in certain browsers, eight in other ones. So, so yeah, he's aware of this issue. He knows how to how to cause the issue. Yeah, um, um, yeah. So they're right. Socket pouch is a good workaround for this issue. Um, it's not a perfect solution to this issue. Really, it would be nice if CouchDB kind of supported a way to do one single have one single connection. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, they're they're, they're kind of right. Like that's there's really no good solution for this right now, at least with the existing APIs as they're written. Socket pouch is probably the best solution to that problem. So um, yeah, I think that's that's probably the best answer for now. So let's look into some more. I'm gonna look at some more red ones. So that hopefully I can just kind of glance at them and be done. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, oftentimes what I do with issues is I, I invite people to make a pull request and, um, I don't feel like that's a very. I don't feel like that's a dismissive thing to say to people. Like, to to say like pull to say pull request welcome. I mean that's kind of like a. There's a there's. There, I've heard people joke about that before, right? About how like dismissive and like um, I don't know, unfair to people that is. I don't think so because here's the thing: is that like when you have a big open source project and lots of people are using it, like. 20 people are going to use it in 20 different ways. And each of those people might have very specific needs or specific edge cases or specific issues they ran into. And maybe it'll never affect the 19 other people, you know, one of those 19 people being the maintainer. So like, should the maintainer be responsible for fixing those 20 edge cases for 20 people? I don't really think so. Like, I think it depends if it's a really bad bug, like a nasty bug that like, like, I don't know, like you, you run into this bug and then like your database is deleted. Or your computer explodes. Like if it's something like that, then yeah, you should go in and fix it. But if it's like just kind of an inconvenience for one user who happened to run into an issue in one way, like in those cases, I'm happy to just say pull request welcome. Like feel free to go in and change the code and fix your particular case, but um, I'm not going to go out of my way to do so because I have other things I'd like to get to. Um, at this point, I'm just trying to get through my open issues actually and just kind of like. I'm just kind of glancing at stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so let's see if I can find a good, like, meaty issue to get into. Actually, let's, let's, 
look at let's try to look at a pull request first because uh, as I said on the episode yesterday I tend to try to look at pull requests before issues because it's sort of like if you went through all the trouble of creating a pull request like you sort of deserve my attention uh, that, that's not really sorry that really sounds like a like an elitist way of putting it it's not that you deserve my attention it's that like you yeah like I guess so like you put in a little bit more effort like you deserve a speedier response. Like, if I was to sort things in a pile, like, people who made pull requests, like, yeah, I should I should address your, your pull request before I look at issues. Um, so let's see what this person is on about. Package JSON Virginify is a dev dependency. Excellent package, by the way. OK. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, actually, no, this is wrong. No, actually, this. Actually, yeah, actually, this is not correct. So I should explain what this module is and why this person's incorrect. So package JSON versionify is a very short browserify transform that I wrote. I'm getting pinged on Twitter right now. Uh, is, is a very short uh, browserify transform that I wrote that basically just allows you to say require package JSON. And then instead of including the whole JSON file, which is huge, it just boils it down to the version because I, I find I just a lot of the time I just want to include the version from package JSON. Like I do this with Service Worker actually, it's kind of neat because then you can easily like manage changes to your Service Worker by just incrementing the package JSON version. It's really really convenient. So I use it for that, and it turns out that with Browserify transforms you don't want to make those dev dependencies because if you do, and if you publish a library that tells Browserify to transform using this transform. Like if you include it as a, a, if you include it in like the browserify part of the package JSON, like uh, I'll show you an example of who does this. Like Calvin does this. I was I was talking about this just yesterday, in for Calvin's project Lie. Like if you go in here, you'll see he has this. Yeah, he lists his browserify transforms. So if you make these a dev dependency, the people who depend on this module will not get it. And so it won't work. It'll actually break when you try to install it. And you can see Calvin knows this. So Calvin has these as dependencies, not dev dependencies. So actually, I'm going to point this out. This is a good example I can kind of link to. Um, oh, by the way, this is a nice, nice trick in case you guys don't know this. Hit Y when you're on GitHub, and it'll give you a permalink. So notice that before it said master at the top. Now it says A877, whatever. So now I have a permanent link to this uh, commit message. So in case Calvin changes his package JSON, the link is still going to work. So anyway, so I'm going to point that out to this person because um, yeah, this is this is a really really subtle, subtle thing, and not a lot of people are aware of it. And so it, it's good to kind of explain to people. Um, let's say I'll say what I what I just said. So I'm just pointing out exactly what I just said. By the way, I never know where to, whether to write Browserify with a capital B or a lowercase b. I know some some projects are really particular about this. Like npm likes to be written all lowercase, and I think Node is technically supposed to be written all lowercase. Um, I I don't know. I'm inconsistent about it. It's kind of a <laughs> I think it's kind of a, a funny affect. Like I mean, come on, we're not we're not E.E. Cummings. We're not poets. Like we're writing software. <laughs> Anyway, so all right, uh, so I close that issue or that pull request. Oh, thanks, Francis. Well, it'll be live afterwards. You can check it then, or not live. It'll be. Um, okay, so let's keep looking at stuff. Oh, I got some comments. It would be nice when closing the issue for duplicate reasons if they would link to the... Yeah, I know, right? When someone just says dupe, and then they close it, and it's like, well, what was it a duplicate of? But, um, 
don't know. Love triage more fun for you this way, or when you or are you talking out loud when you're doing? <laughs> no, I'm not. A, no, uh, trust me, I'm not. I'm not a madman. I'm not. When I do my love triage, I'm not sitting there talking to myself. This is just kind of fun, you know. I got the idea for this live stream basically for two reasons. Number one, because I watch a lot of live streamers playing video games, mostly playing Super Smash Brothers. I'm kind of a Super Smash Brothers like maniac. I really love the game. Um, Melee, in particular, like the old GameCube version of the game. And so I love watching people play it. I watch tournaments and stuff. And I figure, like, if you enjoy sitting there and watching people play video games, then maybe you'd enjoy sitting there and watching people do open source stuff. And also kind of, like, you know, shows what, what life is actually like for open source maintainers. Because when you open an issue on an open source maintainer, I feel like a lot of people don't have a, a notion of, like, who is this person on the other side of the computer? And like, what are they experiencing? And like, and what are their needs? And um, it's really hard to know that unless you yourself are an open source maintainer. So I'm hoping that this will like give more exposure that people can point to this and say like, oh, this is what people deal with when I open an issue. And um, it's not to say that like you should feel reserved about opening issues, but I do notice that some people will open issues just very, um, without, without, without a whole lot of care for the issue, right? They'll go in there and they'll just like, maybe not even have an explanation of what the problem is. They'll just like paste the output from NPM or something. And like, that's just noise that people have to deal with. And that's not really fair, you know? And I feel like it's mostly just a lack of empathy of not knowing what people need in order to get work done. And if you know what the people on the other side of the computer are expecting from the issues you open, then you can do a much better job of making useful issues for them. Like the one we started with at the at the top of the show was an issue where someone had actually posted a pull request with tests written in the test uh, the test framework for that repo showing exactly the failure, which is like ideal. Like like besides like except for fixing the issue itself, like you could not give me a better gift as an open source maintainer. Like it was so easy for me to go in. Well, it was not that easy because I had to set up CouchDB too, but. If, but besides that, like, it was pretty easy for me to go in there, run the test, figure out what was wrong, and fix the issue, you know? And so that was really cool. Um, and there's, like, I find there's a spectrum in, the, in sort of the quality of issues between, like, on the one end of the spectrum, you've got, like, someone just, like, pasting, it doesn't work, or, or pasting a bunch of uh, error output or something. So you got, on one end of the spectrum, you've got that, on the other end, you've got, like, like a pull request, like a really nice pull request. Like for me, the ideal pull request, the exquisite pull request, where you just like you just want to like you just want to like take a nibble of that pull request and just like savor the flavor. It's such a good pull request. Like the good, the really fine pull request, like the fine dining pull request, is they updated the docs. So in case you need to update like the README or something to explain a new feature, um, they added tests. They followed the coding conventions of the repo and they made sure that like you know JS hint or ESLint or whatever was passing and um, oh and also that, that it's small. Like it shouldn't be a super ambitious thing that's like um, you know I wanted to fix this issue but then also I decided to add this other new feature and then you know what I didn't really like that you're using semicolons so I just took out all your semicolons for you. Like those are the worst those aren't the worst pull requests. Those are pretty bad pull requests though because then I have to kind of disentangle it and be like well out of the three things you've changed here, I only really agree with one of them. And so, like, you kind of maybe should have come in here and instead of, like, uh, I think Dave Rupert had a good name for this. He called it rage coding. <laughs> like, when you go in and you're just like, ah, what is this repo? I'm going to just rage code. I'm just going to fix all, the, all your crap. Here, I fixed it for you. Like, instead of just going in and rage coding, you can open an issue saying, like, do you think this is a good idea? Does this sound like a good direction to go in? Um, or, frankly, you can fork it because, like, the great thing with open source is that if you don't agree with the direction a project is going in and you want to, and you, you, you know exactly the problem you want to solve and you know how you want to solve it, then just fork the project, honestly, and like go your own way. Um, it's faster that way. And like, and if you, if you are in a hurry and you don't want to go back and ask for feedback from people, then um, it's the fastest path for you. So um, yeah, so anyway, so what I'm trying to point out is that um, this is just kind of an interesting experiment, this whole live streaming thing. So we'll see how it goes. I don't know. I'm kind of, I, I've got like 10-ish viewers right now, and that's about 10 more than I expected. So I'm pretty pleased right now. Um, 
Anyway, let's keep going. So, uh, oh, this was a question I answered yesterday, which I hope it elucidated the situation for this person. Um, they were trying to figure out how to share data across subdomains, and it turns out you can't do that because the browser doesn't allow you, because it's a security problem. Because say you have a bunch of sites that are hosted on like geocities.com or something, like you don't want those subdomains to be able to access each other's data. That's, that's a security flaw. So browsers don't let you do that. Um, so how can I share a session across my subdomain? Uh, I think you don't share that in local storage. I think you share that with cookies. Yeah, OK. I believe the solution to that, e.g. what Google does, is to use cookies. Because I believe you can specify cookies to work across subdomains. I think. I'm actually not sure. But I admit I'm not sure. In any case, I don't think local storage or local forage, I don't think local storage index DB is the right solution for session management. Well, it's funny, because there is a thing called session storage, but nobody really uses it. Even then, it's not really the right solution for this particular problem, because session storage is also sandboxed across domains. Um, I just got a message from Young. <laughs> nice talking to you, Young. That was fun. I, I'm definitely having fun with this. All right, let's see if we can plug through a few more issues. Um, so as I said, I wanted to look at pull requests before I looked at issues. So here's a pull request, here's another pull request, and here's another one. So I only have three pull requests remaining, so let's look at these. Um, oh, this is just a comment, okay. Oh, and this is closed, okay. Yeah, Nick Colley made a really cool logo for local NPM, which I like a lot. It was really sweet of him. Um, it's just a nice logo. He also made the PouchDB logo, so he's uh, he's uh, he's really been great in the uh, in the community for helping us fix our our design needs. He also like basically wrote the PouchDB website and all the CSS and everything. So kudos to him. Um, so this looks like a documentation change. Document the PouchDB and Express mod plus Express modules be installed. PouchDB and Express modules should be installed along the ex along the Express PouchDB modules to have the most minimal working application. And this is in sync with the example usage. I'm not sure what this person is talking about. Um, oh, I see what they mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually you know that's actually a fair change because it's true. If you're going to be installing Express PouchDB, it's kind of counterintuitive that it actually requires PouchDB and Express as well. Which I mean, I know it looks kind of silly when you look at this and you're like, npm install foobar foobar right? It's like why do I need all this stuff? But we designed this thing to be pretty modular and pluggable, and so you kind of it, it's designed so that you kind of have to um, you have to install all of this stuff. So I think this is a reasonable change, um, and the tests are passing. So I, I'm just going to merge this. Uh, I'm going to make sure that squash merging is enabled for this repo. I believe it is. We're kind of going through all our old projects and making sure that yeah, we only have squash merging. So. Yeah, so let's do confirm squash and merge. Let's put it in our commit format. And we're going to squash and merge. Everything looks good. Yeah, OK, cool. OK, that was easy. Um, oops, I should thank them. Always thank people when they give you pull requests because uh, they're going out of your way, out of their way. It's like a love letter to your repo, you know. So give them a shout out. So this issue or this pull request I looked at yesterday, and I gave my response, which was that I was kind of skeptical, to be honest. So let's see what other people said. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, that's funny. He learned about it because of the hacking video yesterday. Yeah, functions don't pass the web worker threadbare. That's true. 
that's that's the issue this is trying to resolve is like serializing functions. Yeah, so this is, yeah, you're exactly right. Like, it is a security, like, eval is always a security problem. Um, so, I mean, this is this is correct. You're, you're right. Uh, I think, though, that probably lave, L-A-V-E, that project, I think it probably does something like this. It probably does, like, two string and eval. Um, I believe it's a little more subtle than that, though. When I talked to Jed about it, he said that it, it also does some tricks where it's, like, it understands when you're referring to global objects and, like, um, I mean, I, I think, I can't remember exactly what the tricks were, but I, I believe it's a little bit more subtle than just two string and eval. But I, I, I don't actually know. I, I should probably check it out. I haven't actually looked at the code. Um, uh, I will say that, yep, two string, like function two string, and eval are a pretty, uh, pretty good solution to this problem. Although they don't handle every case, e.g., yeah, they, so they they won't work with like closures. Um, so like closures that refer to a variable outside of the function. I believe lave might actually have some tricks that help it catch some of these issues, um, but uh, I'm not sure to be honest. So yeah, the simple fix would be to do two string eval, but I mean it's um it's not going to work for every single function in the world. I mean like I mean just think of it in like there you, there are always going to be functions that aren't going to work in the web view context versus the um the non web view context. You know just like even things like there, there are APIs that only exist in web workers or that only or that don't exist in web workers. You know things like the DOM doesn't exist in a web worker or like. I think Firefox Web Workers has this thing called uh, File Reader Sync, which doesn't exist. It's like a synchronous file reader API that doesn't exist in the UI in the main JavaScript uh, environment. So I mean, there, you're always going to run into differences between those two, which is kind of why my policy with this library, VDOM as JSON, was just I kind of punted on that whole issue. Like, I just don't serialize functions when I'm using this library. I attach my event listeners outside of this library. Like I have, um, like I like. Like uh, I mostly use this in the Pokedex app, where I use VDOM as JSON to to send the the virtual DOM between the worker thread and the main thread. And when I need to do event listeners like tap like quick listeners and things like that, I just do it one step above whatever I'm doing with VDOM. Right? I just attach a, a global event listener on the parent and then wait for things to bubble up, um, which is like. Also more performant to do it that way than to add, than I think. I don't know. Citation needed, but I'm pretty sure it's more performant to have one single event listener than multiple event listeners. Actually, it is. Yeah, that's true. Especially on like a, a list of elements. So um, that I typically work around it. But I mean, if, if these folks want to add that feature to this library and like if they add tests and if it um, and if it passes the test, um, and if it doesn't add too much code, then I'm not you know averse to, to that at all. This again kind of goes back to the thing I was saying earlier about like you put something out there and like 20 people are going to use it in 20 different ways and some of those ways are things that I, I would have never foreseen and I'm not totally averse to adding features to, to make it work in people's, you know, whatever people's use cases might be, but I'm also probably not going to go out of my way to fix, um, to fix that, you know, because I'm not terribly interested in it. Um, okay, so I, I solved this issue. I, I'm really, I'm actually doing a good job on this. I was, I was at, tw I was at seventy, at the start of the day. And now I'm at twenty nine. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jan. Um, it's funny. People are actually listening to me. <laughs> you like this better than live esports, Benjamin? I, I like live esports. I, I watch a lot of streamers, and it's, it's really fun. I enjoy it. Um, Lotar is asking what I'm doing. I am going through all of my GitHub notifications, and I'm trying to get to inbox zero on GitHub. Um,
So um, let's try to get through some more issues. Uh, this one, I think I can solve pretty easily. Or no, not solve it, but I just kind of want to glance at it. Angular PouchD is not a project that I maintain or really have any interest in. I just kind of watch it to see what's up with it. Um, I know it. I know in the past it's had problems integrating with other plugins, other PouchD plugins, like Relational Pouch. So I'm kind of not surprised to see this issue come up. What did I say? I said it might be reasonable to just manually add method names for the popular patch to plugins. Yeah, because I, I couldn't think of a way to make it make the API that this thing defines pluginizable. Um, I guess somebody must have commented on this recently. This was kind of a while ago that this all happened. Um, yeah, this is this is the kind of issue that comes up a lot. People just want a, a tutorial to to get started with this stuff. And unfortunately, um, I think there is no tutorial out there for how to use Angular PouchDB with Relational Pouch. Um, not that I'm aware of. In fact, I don't even know if you can. Um, uh, I mean, what I'd like to tell this person is I'd like to say, honestly, you probably shouldn't be using Angular PouchDB. I've never used it. I've done lots of Angular projects, and I've never used Angular PouchDB. I've always just done it myself. But I mean, that's kind of like the power user thing, right? And like, power users want to just get in there and use the libraries directly. And newbies want to have like a nice layer, like a glue layer between the two layers already written for them to make things easier. So it's not really my place to go in and say like you should be doing it this way, you should be doing it the pro way, you know. And also, I don't want to go into this person's repo and say don't use this repo. That's like that's that's a jerk move. So um, I prefer to just say nothing. I think. Um, Yeah, I, I really don't have much to say here. I don't think there's anything I could say that's helpful to this person. Maybe I could just say, uh, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't think there's anything I, anything useful I can say here. All right, let's keep looking at stuff. Um, I will get to local npm eventually, but I kind of want to get through other issues first. Um, let's see what this issue is on Express Patch DB. We use Express CouchDB mainly as a simple in-memory replacement for CouchDB. It allows our developers to skip the CouchDB installation and configuration steps and just start working. Ah, awesome. That's exactly what we intended it for. Um, not production ready, not designed to be run in production, um, not anywhere near as battle tested as CouchDB, but you can quickly get it up and running and it works and, for the most part and it passes most of the, of the actually it passes all of the CouchDB test suite. So, it's, it's pretty rock solid from that perspective, but not nearly as rock solid or fast as CouchDB, so don't use it in production. So I'm glad to hear people are using it that way. The issue I'm now facing is that the artifacts that are created when spinning up a server, namely config.json and log that text, well, not the end of the world, they certainly are a bit annoying. Since we are mostly using Express Patch to use a purely in memory store, it's tripped up many of my engineers as to why those files are being created. Yeah, I've heard of people dealing with this. I noticed a comment on 160 that seems to partially address my issue. We're simply sticking the config in temp or piping the log to dead null is not a good solution for that for us. We have Express Patch to be buried beneath several layer, layers of abstractions, abstraction handles the configuration of logging on its own. So would it be possible to have an option that allows the configuration and logging to be purely in memory? I noticed that for logging this may be particularly difficult since the CLI seems to be tailing the log proper data. I'm willing to tackle this if you guys are up for it. Um, this is something that I, I didn't really implement most of this logic that he's talking about, this kind of config file stuff. That was Martin de Vries, who is a, a Pouch TV contributor. I think he's from the Netherlands. Um, and uh, he's, he's mostly written that, and uh, he implemented it as modules that Express Pouch TV depends on. And I know it's been a, a source of annoyance for some people, um, but it works, and it's really solid. Um, unfortunately, though, I seem to remember... If I think back to the code, there's lots of places where it's just kind of like it does like an fs read file and it expects those files to exist. So unfortunately, this would be a pretty big change uh, in order to implement what he's talking about. Um, and I'm not sure how backwards compatible it would even be. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, I think Martin DeVries would be able to comment more accurately on this than me, but last I checked, most of that config file logic is very deeply baked into Express PouchDB and some dependent modules. Like, I think PouchDB auth does this. Um, so, 
it would probably be it would probably be a big change to do what you're asking. Um, that said, uh, yeah. Uh, that said, if you can if you can find a simple way, a simple way to allow it to check whether it's in in memory mode and not create files, or not create or read files. In that case, then that would be a welcome PR. Yeah. So again, hey, it comes back to like PR is welcome, right? This is another thing where it's like. I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm like, I know the change that would need to be made. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for very little payoff, honestly. Because the payoff here is that the payoff here is that it doesn't write some config files. Like, yeah, that's convenient. Yeah, that's kind of nice. But like, man, I'm just thinking in my head all the code, all the, the code paths you'd have to change to make this work, and um, it'd be gnarly. It'd be pretty gnarly. So, I mean, if you want to put in all that effort in order to make this, what I think is a, a pretty minor change, like. By all means, go ahead. Like if it if it fixes your your use case, if it makes it um, if it makes your code easier to work with for your junior developers, then by all means, go in and do that. Um, but uh, I, I I'm not gonna implement that. So um, I'm gonna add a label on this. Sometimes I like to specify whether an issue is a bug or an enhancement because it's really useful to be able to look back and say, okay, this is a serious bug. I should look into this. Or this is just like. Someone said, wouldn't it be nice if it did this? You know, and so it's good to keep keep tabs on that. Okay, how am I doing? Let's do PouchDB load. What is this issue? This is an old issue. Seems like a lot of people have had this problem, and I did not really address it. Oh, two people have had this problem. Um, what is the issue? When I use the proxy, let me see error db name dot defined. If one dot three dot five it looks fine. Uh, what? Oh my god. And then they post they post a test to reproduce in TypeScript. I've never used TypeScript in my life. I don't really know it that well. Um, uh, there's no proxy option. The block returns done, which is not an info object, but can define. Oh. Okay, well, now here's, here's another kind of issue. This is a really funny issue right here, I find. Um, occasionally, these kind of issues come up where someone, someone figures out a bug, and they go in, and they basically paste the code required to fix the bug into GitHub. And honestly, I, I, I don't actually enjoy this kind of interaction very much. Like, this is a pull request that's not a pull request. You know, like, someone came in and said, like, I ran into this problem. Here's how you could fix it in TypeScript, and here's a bunch of TypeScript code, um, and here's like, here's a diff, you know, that you should paste in your code to fix this. But um, they didn't actually fix the problem, right? Like, it would have been nice, with all the work that they put into investigating it and identifying the exact line of code that throws the problem and the exact source of the problem and how to fix the problem, they could have fixed it, right? Instead, I'm looking at this, and me as a maintainer on my Sunday afternoon as I'm going through like, <laughs> like, I've got 30 other issues in my queue. Like, I'm looking at this and trying to ask myself if uh, I think it's worth my time to read through all of this and uh, make exactly the changes that he's telling me that I should make in my code base uh, to fix this particular case. Which is, and, and this, this bug, by the way, is not a very, it's not a super, super serious bug. Because the bug here is that, um, I think the bug here is that when you, I believe when you call load, it's supposed to return an info object that gives you like some some stats on how many documents were imported, I believe. And in this case, it's it's returning it's returning successfully, but it's returning undefined, which which uh, people weren't expecting. So again, it's a very niche bug, and it's not it's not really that big of a deal. So um, honestly, I kind of look at this and I think like it's kind of not worth my time to look into, but. Um, on the other hand, there is an up uh, there's an upside to this, which maybe when I go in here, I can try to convince this person to open a pull request. You know, um, so I'll just like be very kind about it and just say, you know, um, I'll say thanks. It sounds like 
you've done the heavy lifting to figure out the source of the problem. If you could uh, convert the code pasted above into a pull request, ideally with a test to isolate the problem, isolate the issue, then that would be much appreciated. And then I'll go in and I'll put label bug help wanted. I should, story of my life, I should just go into every single issue and put help wanted on it because that's really, that's really what it is. Um, anyway, but, but, so my response to this is like, I, I, I don't really want to spend the time to fix this. And maybe this person will. Like, um, now that I've gone in and commented and um, validated that, yes, they're right about this, maybe they'll go in and maybe they will fix it. Although it was 18 days ago. I don't know. Part of the problem here is I think, I think psychologically, if you catch people right when they file an issue and right when they're thinking about it, it's like top of mind for them, then that's kind of like, that's the moment to strike because maybe that's the point where they're most willing to like um, collaborate with you or to to make progress on the issue, you know, but if it was 18 days ago, you know, they might have moved on to some, something else, their, their mind is elsewhere, and so probably, probably I'm never going to hear back, um, but um, I don't really care to take the time to fix this, so that's what it comes down to. All right, 27 issues. <laughs> yeah, that's true, Mary, yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, creepy stalker love letter of entitlement. <laughs> well, that is true. Occasionally you do get some weird some weird pull requests like that. But let's see. And people are talking in the chat. Valid response always looks good, want to open PR. People aren't always comfortable doing that without interaction, sort of a plus one. Good process is always open up PR and get a combo going, but that isn't what most people do. And you're on top of it. I'm trying to keep on top of it. I mean, responding after 18 days to me is not keeping on top of it. I've been really bad about this. Somebody actually asked me, I think, who was it? I think it was uh, Michael Hart mentioned this on Twitter. Uh, like the subject came up of like why, why I'm behind, or, or rather, let me put it this way. The reason that I'm behind on these issues is because I was actually kind of heads down on a project for like the past two, three weeks, where basically like each weekend I was just devoting myself entirely to this new project. And I was trying to like silence everything, like ignore everything else, put on the blinders. Because while it's true that a lot of open source work is like interacting with people and discussion and like documentation and stuff that's not code, a lot of it is also code. And I especially find that in the case where I'm writing a completely new project from scratch, I really need like complete concentration and I need to just like shut out everything else and just work on this. And the project that I was working on was the SQLite plugin 2, um, which uh, I'm really proud of. I think it's a good project. Um, I hope that people end up using it and that it um, it does some good for them because um, it's a fork technically. And this is this kind of goes back to what I was saying about like um, you should be classy when you fork. Like don't don't smack talk the other repo too badly. And I, I really tried hard not to smack talk this repo as much as I could. The one that I, I forked essentially, not really a fork. I actually, I, I mostly rewrote it. Like, um, I actually like hit new project and rewrote this thing basically. And then I, I think I borrowed some, I think I borrowed some code from Objective C, but I rewrote the JavaScript and the Java from scratch. In any case, it was a new project, and I was kind of head down working on it for like weeks and weeks, and that's why I was I got behind on GitHub. This was a really fun project though, and incidentally, in this project actually. Most of my time was not spent on writing the code itself, it was spent writing the tests for the code. So anyone, if you're interested in how to actually get a Cordova plugin that runs the tests against actual iOS simulators and Android simulators, this project actually does it. And it does it with Zool with some tricks where I, um, I get Zool running and then I basically download all the Zool HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and turn it into a Cordova application. And then I run the Cordova application and I like communicate with it using Appium and check that the Zool tests are passing. And it works really, really well. Like, um, 
like on Travis, you can see I actually managed to get tests running in iOS and Android on multiple versions of each. Um, but this actually took the longest time. Like I, I had this project working for forever, and then uh, and then the tests were the hardest part. Um, so I mean, it looks like it's failing here, but the reason it looks like that is because this is a pull request from someone else, and the problem is that when you open a pull request and you don't have access to that repo, you don't have the private environment variables in Travis because it's a security that's a security vulnerability because you could just echo them and then you would know like people's passwords and stuff. Unfortunately, that means that they can't access Sauce Labs. You'll notice that uh, there's a Phantom JS test test that's passing, but everything that relies on Sauce, Lab is, Sauce Labs isn't passing. But if you go and look at the actual master builds, you'll see that everything's passing. Um, yeah, and so you see, I've, I've got this project that tests in Phantom JS, tests in Android 4.4, Android 5.1, iOS 8.0, and iOS 9.2 with WK WebView instead of UI WebView. So that was really hard to get up and running, all those different tests. Um, but it works. It works with uh, Sauce Labs, which is nice. Where did that pull request come from? Did someone? Oh, yeah, I think someone made a change to the README. Did I close this, or did I? No, I merged it. OK. Oh, yeah, this was just from the documentation. So there was a bug in the documentation. Well, I hope it's actually passing in master, because I merged this, and then, yeah, then it probably failed. Yeah, so, I mean, OK, Sauce Labs is great. I love Sauce Labs. It's an amazing free service. I could not do my open source work without Sauce Labs, but occasionally I do run into issues where like um, tests fail randomly. So it's a good. This is a good time to check to see if master for this project is actually failing or not. Um, why? Oh, maybe I told it to skip CI when I merged it. In any case, it looks like master is passing, so I'm not going to think about it too much. Anyways, a README change. Like when you change a README. We shouldn't rerun all the tests. It doesn't matter. But anyway, I got off on a tangent. But um, yeah, so Jamie, I, I'm not really on top of my notifications, but I'm working on it. That's that's why I'm here right now. Um, thank you for keeping me company while I get through all this stuff. Um, well, this is neat. I responded to this person yesterday, and it looks like they responded back. Um, they suggested a feature for one of my apps, and um, I said, yes, it sounds like a nice feature. And their response is that they don't have time to look into it, which that's perfectly fine. You know, we've all got lives. Like, that's cool. Oh, uh, oh, I got a question here. Well, um, Gareth. Typically, we do releases at the top of the month. Uh, I think we've been kind of lax about it. We haven't done it this month. Um, yeah. Uh, but we've been kind of lax recently, mostly because me and Dale have been on vacation slash doing other stuff. Um, but I was planning on doing a release soonish after most of the pull requests, the open PRs were merged. Like there was an issue that was opened recently where I think Jan and Gregor found an issue in replication of attachments, which I'm I think is either a bug in the replicator or maybe the tests are wrong. But I'm not sure. It scares me, and so I just I, I kind of wanted to fix that before um, before doing another release. But in, in principle, like we will probably do the release. Um, maybe June. We'll probably do it in June. Um, yeah. So we'll probably do it in June. Yeah. Top of the month, typically. Occasionally we skip some months. Anyway, let's keep going through issues. I'm going to go back to GitHub notifications. Okay. Uh, let's go through these pouch to be authentication issues because it looks like these are mostly questions rather than bugs. So I just want to, I can probably just respond to people. 
Oh, Rich Lit, that's funny. I actually met him in Brooklyn JS recently. He's a cool guy. Um, he did that, uh, the user is drunk, where it's like this, um, this service where he would like get drunk and then review your code um, and like take a video of it, um, which was, it was really funny. But then he wrote this nice like somber follow-up piece where he talked about how like, he actually realized that was kind of uncool and he felt like he was kind of like making light of alcoholism. And so he decided to stop doing that service. And also it wasn't, it wasn't good for his body. And so he stopped doing it for that reason, which is totally legit. So very legit guy. Um, I remember this issue and I remember him opening a pull request and I remember me basically saying that I think there should be a test before this pull request is merged. Um, uh, yeah, somebody opened a, a, a pull request for this. What happened? Did it get fixed? I can't even remember. Did I merge this or not? No, I closed it. Um, okay, yeah, I ended up saying that um, the fix seems reasonable, but I want there to be a test, which is, um, I think that's a reasonable thing to ask. Um, so, there was some progress in this PR, but I would feel most comfortable if we had a new test to go along change. Um, and also this is another thing where it's like, um, this is a very niche kind of issue and you can work around it. You can work around it by just like not including a slash at the end of the, the URL when you pass it in to this method. That's all you have to do. And so again, like this is another one of those issues where it's, it's like super, super niche. And um, so that's, that's why I haven't really been on top of it. Anyway, um, okay, so someone's asking for help with Ionic 2. Um, this is another thing where it's like basically they're saying there should be a tutorial. So I'm just going to say uh, I would love if someone would write a tutorial, um, even on their private blog, it's fine. But um, I think for this repo, it would be best to remain framework agnostic. Thanks for opening the issue, though. Yeah. This subject kind of came up yesterday. I was talking about it. Someone filed a similar issue on local forage. And um, there's kind of there's this question in my head of like where, like, what the line is between documentation and a tutorial, you know? And like, where is it appropriate to do a tutorial and where is it appropriate to do documentation? And I sort of feel like the conclusion I've kind of come to is that um, unless you really have time to sit down and like make a detailed tutorial, and it, as long and unless that tutorial is framework agnostic or say whatever you're writing is deeply tied into a framework and you can't avoid that framework, like unless all those things are the case, then you should probably just leave it to the community to write blog posts and stuff because people who are approaching a uh, a piece of software for the first time and trying to integrate, try to work with it, and especially if they're beginners, I don't think they go to documentation. I don't think they, I think they kind of intuitively like don't trust the docs on the project because it's just too dense. And it doesn't like, it doesn't tell them step by step how to make, how, how to use this, this, this library. You know, so like for instance, um, let's say you're writing a Cordova application and you're using the SQLite plugin with CouchDB. There is all the documentation in the world that you need to do exactly that. Unfortunately, you have to kind of piece it together because it's all API docs, right? Right. So you're going to be pulling it from like this part of the PouchDB docs and this part of the SQLite plugin docs and this part of the Cordova docs. And what people do, though, which is really nice, is that they write blog posts where they say, like, I, here's an example where I can think of, I can think of right now. Someone uh, wrote, um, someone wrote a a tutorial about how to do this. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, she also, wait a second, I'm going to find it because it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Ashtaya, that's right. Yeah, she has written a lot of blog posts on this kind of subject. And um, yeah, so she wrote, okay, so here, here's a blog post she wrote. So here's, here's a perfect example. She wrote a blog post saying, like, step by step, 
here's how you start off. Uh, like here's here's how you uh, yeah. Here's how you set this up. Do this command, then do this command, then do this command. Here's a screenshot of what it's going to look like. Here's the next thing to do. And when you're a beginner and you're just learning to code, this is gold for you. You love this. This this is how you get started, right? Like I, I got started on this kind of stuff. Like when I was making my first web apps, I didn't know all the intricacies of JavaScript. I, I, I started by learning Angular, I think, or maybe jQuery. I can't remember. jQuery and Angular, probably. And I probably followed somebody's tutorial like this. I probably did not go to the official documentation for jQuery or Angular very frequently. I probably started with this stuff. And you can put this stuff inside of your your um, your uh, GitHub for the project. You can put it on the wiki or something, or even in the README. But I think that if you put it in the README, it very quickly like starts to kind of balloon. And then if you put it in the wiki, then there's kind of this implication that like you're maintaining it. And you're kind of taking it upon yourself to maintain it. Whereas I think it makes more sense in these cases to just let the community manage it. You know, let people publish it on their private blogs because then like it has the added benefit of it gives them exposure. Like you know, you can point to all these blog posts you've written and say like, look, you know, clearly I understand how this software works because I wrote it. I wrote the tutorial on it, right? And this is super useful for for beginners. It's super helpful for you as you're writing it to like kind of go through your thought process about how to integrate these different libraries. And it's really useful for the authors of those libraries because they don't need to go in and learn how 20 different frameworks work and write 20 different tutorials about how to integrate your library with that framework. They can just point to your blog post. So yeah, so I think that like it's best to just point people to these things. And um, I wish I could just point this person to the uh, to this blog post, but uh, I kind of can't because unfortunately, see, this blog post explains how to use PouchDB plus Ionic, and what this person is asking is how to use PouchDB authentication with Ionic two. So, until somebody writes a tutorial, and that person is not going to be me because I don't really know Ionic two. So, um, until somebody writes a tutorial, unfortunately, uh, it's not. Not a whole lot that can be done here. And certainly, I, I don't think it's my responsibility to write that tutorial. Um, maybe I will. Maybe I will write, write a tutorial for some framework that I'm interested in. But I'm not, to, I'm not completely, I'm not super, super interested in Ionic 2 right now, or at least not interested enough to write that tutorial, so I'm not going to. Um, so this person is asking about TypeScript and about Ionic 2. That makes sense. I, I, I think I heard that. The convention for both Angular 2 and Ionic 2 is TypeScript. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in this though. Like, like I'm not going to write the TypeScript definitions for this project. I don't even know TypeScript. I've never written a line of TypeScript in my life. You know? So actually, my understanding is you don't need to host the TypeScript definitions in the package itself. We never did this for PouchDB, and people have never complained because there is. Okay, somebody wrote this. I swear, somebody wrote TypeScript definitions for PouchDB. I know you don't need to do it in the library itself. Yeah, there's this thing called definitely typed that does this. Um, Whoa. Well, huh. maybe it hasn't been maintained, though. That's kind of sad. Yeah, it looks like the TypeScript definitions for PouchDB have not been very maintained. Um, hmm. Yeah, so, uh, hmm. well, again, it, I don't know. I, I, again, I don't feel like it's it's my place to go in and, and work on this because I'm not I don't use TypeScript. It's not something that I'm really interested in. But um, it seems like there is a way to do TypeScript definitions and not have to bother the maintainers of those libraries in order to add them. So yeah, see, it seems like there's a thing here for it. So oh man, this is really killing my browser performance. So I'm just going to point to this and say that. Um, I think I'd, I'd prefer to, yeah. 
Uh, I think I'd prefer to put the TypeScript definitions in definitely typed. There, there are already some definitions for CouchDB itself over here. Thanks for opening the issue, though, and um, if you'd like to contribute the TypeScript definitions to definitely typed, that would be awesome. This is one of the things I don't get about TypeScript, to be honest, is that, like, how do you use modules? Like, how do you use popular NPM modules? Or do you just only use the most popular ones, you know? Like, do you just use Lodash, and you just use um, Moment, and you don't use anything else? Because, like, I can't imagine that the other ones are, are as well maintained, you know? Like, CouchDB is a good example. It's not the most popular project in the world. It's probably top, I don't know, 100 on NPM, maybe, maybe 200. So it's not surprising to me that it doesn't have up-to-date TypeScript definitions, but yeah, I feel like if you use TypeScript, like you must really suffer a lot from like the TypeScript definitions getting out of date with this library or that other library. Like um, it's one of the reasons I haven't chosen TypeScript for my own projects. Anyway, uh, I'm not going to get worked up about that. Uh, let's see, what is this about? Get session only functional after a timeout. Hmm. Well, it looks like they solved their problem, so uh, I would prefer to just close this one. Uh, I'm just going to say, thanks, please reopen as necessary. How am I doing on issues? 23. Sweet. I'm, I'm really making progress on them. Maybe I actually will get to inbox zero. Huh? Is anybody actually watching me get to inbox zero? I'm out of coffee and out of water as well. How are we doing? 10 viewers, okay. Hey, everyone out there watching. Hoping this is still entertaining at this point. My voice is starting to give a little bit, but uh, I'm powering through. It, this is this is definitely more fun than, than it would have been if I'd just been tackling these issues without... Um, without live streaming at the same time, you know? So I'm definitely, I'm having fun right now. Um, let's see. It looks like Martin just responded. I'm kind of amazed he's awake. Isn't it like midnight over in uh, the Netherlands or wherever he is? Is he still in the Netherlands? I think he is. Yeah. What time is it? Current time, Netherlands. 11.30 p.m., yeah. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Oh, okay. That's funny. See, I, I thought it'd be a lot more work to do this feature, but Martin seems to think it wouldn't be very much work, and he, he definitely knows more about that code than I do, so um, I would defer to him. So, that's cool. So maybe, okay, maybe this will be a good feature for Express Patch DB. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So, I want to do local NPM last. Because that's a big one. There's a lot to do there. Um, and with CouchDB, I mostly just kind of want to keep on top of it. Um, I'm going to look at this real quick because this is a show. Uh, this is a podcast that I'm going to be on soon where they invited us to join on GitHub, which is cool. I think that's a good way to organize. Like, um, you know, <laughs> we try to keep up on our GitHub issues, and so it's usually a good place to. to to ping us, um, although uh, obviously I have not done an excellent job of keeping up to date on things. But uh, let's see, what does Kent have to say? Let's see, uh, I already sent him that information, I think. I sent it to him in email, so that's all done. Okay, so I don't need to look at that. Um, he made some changes to the repo, added my picture. Okay, cool, that looks good. And then, okay, so uh, I'm going to finish up the PouchDB issues first, and then I'm going to look into this fruit down issue, and I might actually test it because I might, I, I just recently updated my iOS simulator, so it'll be, it'll be a good time to test Safari Mobile with this issue that, um, I think that's Ronnie Ren, yeah, who raised. So let's get through these PouchDB issues first, okay. Problem syncing many records from CouchDB over internet connection. Ooh, ooh, how exotic. You're, you're using an internet connection to sync to CouchDB. 
That's um, it's very unusual. I mean, I, you know, I'm not too familiar with this whole internet thing, but um, I, I can I can try to look into it. You know, it's, it's kind of obscure. I might have to do some research, but um, sorry, I'm making fun of people. I shouldn't be making fun. Anyway, they opened this issue quite a while ago, so I probably looked at it before, but um, oh, he took a while, he took a few months to respond. Um, well, he didn't, res he didn't re reply with a whole lot of details. So this is one of those cases where someone, like, explains in English what their bug was, you know? And it's like, that can be useful, yes it can, but it's much, much more useful to have a reproducible test case. And in this case, we don't have a reproducible test case, and so it's uh, not clear what's going on. Like, um, th this this bug could be anything, you know? It's really hard to say. It could be CouchDB, it could be PouchDB, it could be the connection between the two, it could be a faulty internet connection, like, who knows, you know? Um, so, I don't even know if I should keep this open. I kind of feel like I should close it and unless you provide more details, like, um, yeah, needs reproducing, I'll say. That's a good label to add. And it's also a bug, apparently, so. It's a bug, help wanted, needs reproducing. That sounds like a good, good response to that. Okay, um, I opened this issue recently where I said that um, it'd be nice to update the documentation on PouchDB for the SQLite plugin. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so I opened this issue just saying that like it'd be nice to have a documentation change to mention. Um, yeah, mention that you need to pass in the location key if you're using the SQLite plugin one. You don't need to do that if you're if you're using SQLite plugin two. Um, anyway, uh, what I was saying. Oh, let me say. That would be awesome. So I love it when someone offers to take up an issue. I love it even more when they just take up the issue, but it, it, it's okay. It's, it's cool to come in and ask permission. Sometimes it's, it's nice to get feedback on this stuff. So. Um, let's see. Can you please elaborate in your comment about needing a new release? Um, uh, I was just uh, about the new release. About the new release, I was just trying to point out that the location fix does not actually work in the late in the current release of PouchDB, but will be fixed in the next one. Um, because what happened was uh, SQLite plugin one changed their API, and they require this uh, this new field location, which tells it where to store data on the native side, on iOS or an Android, and um, yeah, we weren't like. We weren't really aware that that change was going to be made, so that breaking change went in, and we were kind of caught blindsided by it. So it's it's actually currently broken in PouchDB uh, in the current release. But anyway, um, but anyway, if you make your change to the docs, we'll just push those doc changes when we do the new release. Yeah. Okay, so that has been responded to, uh, destroy race condition causing the IndexedDB to hang. This is one of the oldest issues in PouchDB. I think I filed it. And I believe it's more of an IndexedDB issue than a PouchDB issue. I kind of mentioned it yesterday that um, the way to get around it is just to wait for all your queries, queries to complete before you um, destroy a database. Or just don't destroy databases. Like, the whole, like, the, the IndexedDB destroy database API is really flaky, I found. So it's often safer just to like, um, like delete the object stores instead of deleting the whole database. Like it has, it has to like close down the connection to it and stuff and like weird, weird race conditions can happen in, in different browsers. So let's see if someone responded. So someone responded and said, I ran into this uh, exception in Chrome. Hmm. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, that's actually a really funny issue. Um, so as it turns out, that whole um, this API uh, is actually quasi-deprecated, which is why we removed it from the docs. 
if it fixes your issue, then that's kind of troubling. But I would guess it's because of a race condition under the hood with index DP. Normally, this problem can be worked around by just making sure that you don't try to access the database at the same time that you're destroying it. Or in the case of MapReduce, to make sure that your queries have completed before destroying. Um, this is another one of those, this is one of those things that were, uh, we maybe could fix it in PouchDB proper, but the way we'd have to fix it would be to move to using a soft destroy rather than a, a hard destroy. The soft destroy being the thing I said about destroying the object stores within IndexedDB instead of destroying the, the entire IndexedDB database, which requires like closing connections and stuff. And the reason that I know that would be a fix that would work is because uh, that's what we do in Web SQL. And actually, nobody runs into this issue in Web SQL because when you delete, all, when you drop all the tables in Web SQL, it just becomes like another write transaction. And under the hood, Web SQL is just like ordering all those transactions in serial. And so it works, um, which we had to do in Web SQL because there is no way to destroy a Web SQL database. It was never added to the spec. So anyway, there is an open issue to add a soft delete, but we haven't done it. I think mostly the reason we haven't is because if we did, that would break the PouchDB inspector, which currently re relies on querying all the available IndexedDB databases using a hidden API in Chrome. So we didn't feel like it was worth breaking the PouchDB inspector because a lot of people rely on it. And we didn't, we hadn't come up with a better way to fix that in the PouchDB inspector. So long story short, uh, there are ways to work around this, but um, not a lot of super good ways. Um, yeah, glad you enjoyed it, Ben. Wow, welcome to welcome to YouTube live streamings. Weird people come in and say weird things. I wonder if I can kick them out. That is really creepy. Um, Let's just block that user. Sorry, that's really bizarre. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go grab some water, come right back, and then uh, I'm probably gonna wrap up in like 30 minutes. I don't think I'm gonna get to inbox zero today, but at some point I have to eat food. Um, and uh, yeah, and also I'm getting kind of tired. So I'm like, I'm, I wonder what I've been streaming for. Like three hours, I think. Almost three hours. This is this is kind of fascinating. Just to get an idea, five people watching. <laughs> They're dropping like flies. Yeah, I'm I'm starting to run out of energy too. I don't blame you. Um, this is kind of interesting just to see what my velocity is on fixing these issues. It's probably a lot slower than it would be if I wasn't streaming because I wouldn't be talking at the same time. Um, but it is kind of interesting to see. Like I started off with uh, seventy issues and now I'm down to twenty. Uh, so I fixed fifty in the course of three hours. So uh, velocity is not great, but um, it's OK. Not doing too bad. Yeah, all right, I'll be right back. I would be drinking coffee, but it's uh, it's 5.41 where I am right now, and um, I try not to drink coffee after 5 p.m. if I can avoid it, because it usually keeps me up. Frankly, it's getting to the point where it's beer o'clock. I don't know if the five people remaining would be interested in watching some guy uh, do drunk coding, though, no. so I'm probably not going to do that. Anyway, um, okay, so let's keep going. Uh, how many am I down to now? How many open issues? 18. Okay. That's pretty good. I'm going to tweet about that. Maybe we can get some more viewers if I tweet again. I'm, I'm starting, my, my, my energy is starting to wane now. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It's, um, 
it's been kind of kind of kind of a slog. I mean, I've been doing this for three hours, so. Although normally when I do open source stuff, like sometimes I, I will spend like a good solid like five hours, you know, doing open source work. Are you guys still enjoying this? Is everyone still having fun for the four people watching? Um, did you just leave the YouTube window open? <laughs> um, anyway, let's tweet about this. How many issues are over at 18 now? This was a really weird project, I will admit. Like, it's kind of, it's a strange idea. Um, uh, like, I actually, you know, I mostly kind of hope that this will inspire other people to do this work, you know? Like, I, I would really love, you know, I would love to sit down and just kind of like watch other people do open source work, especially if someone's like, um, you know, charismatic and charming, which, uh, <laughs> I can't really claim for myself that much. Um, it'd, be, it'd be really fun, like in the same way that it's fun to watch some of these charismatic and charming play video games, you know? So I hope that people take this up. I remember that uh, Sam Sicconi started started live streaming his open source stuff. And I think um, Ashley uh, from NPM was gonna do that too. So it'd be cool, I think that'd be awesome. I would love to see people doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, let's speed this out. All right, I'm gonna to try to power through these final 18 issues. Let's just do it. If if for if nothing else, um, if for no other reason than to um, if for no other reason than to just go in and and acknowledge that the issue exists, because oftentimes that's like the least you can do for people, right? Like just go in there and and point out that um, like just just point out, yes, I acknowledge that you ran into a problem. Yes, I validate that you are running into a problem, and that I, I, I feel for you, like, I, I hurt for you, you know? Because, like, the saddest thing is when you open an issue on a repo and you don't hear anything back for, like, three months, I would say. I thought I was following there. That's fine. Um, like, that's super sad, you know? And I, I've had that happen to me before, where I opened a, uh, an issue, or even a pull request, and, like, I try to make my pull requests and my issues pretty, um, pretty high quality, you know, when I can. So, uh, and, and when I have a really high quality pull request, it, it hurts all the more when someone doesn't respond. But you know, even if, even if a pull request or an issue isn't, isn't high, high priority or uh, high quality, like that person is at least like engaging with your project and like, um, and they, they, they merit a response, you know? And so like, if, if I can at least just go through these open issues and, and respond to them and say, yes, I hear you and yes, I will look at this, then that's the least I can do, and that's, that's the best thing I can do in this case. Uh, I do have a huge backlog of issues, issues that I have kind of marked as red, but that I still need to get to, so I definitely will add some of those things to that. Like, I have this, this kind of master list of, like, big high-profile high bugs that I want to look at at some point, and, uh, and I do eventually get to them. Like, like I think I, um, yeah, I, I started this, this uh, this sort of this sort of to do list, like a few months ago, I think I want to say, and uh, I have actually made progress on closing down a lot of these issues. This, by the way, was a coping mechanism that I came up with because I found that at a certain point I just could not keep on top of my open issues on GitHub, and like the GitHub interface, you know, I I know GitHub is improving quite a bit, and I know that. They, they they are listening to us, especially since that Dear GitHub letter, which I didn't sign, but I definitely was like, I was, I was on board with it. I think a lot of their claims were, um, or a lot of the complaints that they raised were valid. Um, but like, I, I know that they're improving, but it's still really, really hard for me to kind of just keep, like, keep a grasp of what issues I should be working on, which ones are the highest priority, which ones uh, I want to put on the back burner for the time being, which ones I want to delegate to other people. like. 
And I mean, part of that is just because GitHub is not Jira, you know, and it doesn't want to be Jira, and it probably shouldn't be Jira because Jira is like has like thirty thousand knobs and fiddles, and is super complicated, especially for newbies to get involved with. Um, but at the same time, like it, this interface is kind of insufficient for doing the kind of work that I'm trying to do with open source anyway. So yeah, so my coping mechanism is to have this big gist where I just keep a, a bunch of like a bunch of check boxes of all the stuff that I'm trying to look into at some point. But this list comes after the open GitHub notifications though, because like I said, first priority is to make sure that people are, feel like they're being heard. Because, well, I mean, think about it. Like, think about that, that person who filed the issue like 18 days ago, where they basically, they, they did everything but file the pull request, right? And it was left at that. Now imagine that if I'd gone back and if I responded to that person 18 days ago, and if I had said, yes, this looks like the right fix, yes, that looks great, can you please open a pull request, maybe they would have opened a pull request because, you know, it was top of their mind then. They were thinking about it. They were maybe ready to make that commit. Um, and, like, and then maybe I would have a nice pull request right now. Instead, I just have an open issue, and I have a bunch of, a bunch of people commenting on it, and maybe it'll never even get fixed. You know, it's kind of a sad situation. It's a sad situation, and I, I could have I could have avoided that situation by getting in and just responding to the person, you know. So like I, I admire the open source maintainers who are able to actually keep on top of their issues and to do it every single day diligently and to go in and to actually respond to people within like minutes of them posting an issue. I've seen people who responded to me within like minutes of me posting an issue. Um, I really really admire that, and uh, so I'm I'm striving to be better, which is partially why I started this whole live stream so that I could like motivate myself to get in there and um, and actually resolve all these open issues. I mean, yesterday morning I, I, I woke up on Saturday and I was I was staring at 150 unread GitHub notifications. And so now I'm down to 18. So definitely the live stream has worked insofar as like uh, it's it's giving me the motivation to go in there and, and tackle these issues. Um, oh hey Robin's in here. Hey five families here too. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's cool, Robin. I'm glad you're watching. Yeah, uh, well, I hope you enjoy it, uh, even if the font is a bit small on a small screen. Yeah, um, I tried to increase the font size when I'm coding and stuff, um, but um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to follow along. Even, even when the font is big, it's hard to follow along, you know, like... Uh, Code in general is just, especially an unfamiliar repo, is just really hard. Even when you're looking at someone working on it, you're like, how do they know to navigate through all these different parts of the, the file system and everything? So I try to explain what I'm doing, but it's um, it, it's kind of tough sometimes, you know. So I just opened this. Oh, I, I just responded to this person 20 minutes ago, and they responded back. Um, yeah, okay, so, yes, yeah, see, look, so, actually, this person is absolutely right. I mean, they just called me. They just called me on the very thing that I myself just noticed and I didn't really mention here. So they're actually absolutely right. Um, I mean, so, okay. This person is right that, that TypeScript definitions get out of date. But I think that's a fault of TypeScript and not a fault of the project maintainers who, like, I, I don't think it's the responsibility of people writing JavaScript libraries to provide, um, you know, I don't know, like, um, to provide a CoffeeScript version and uh, an ES6 module version and oh, what are all the other ways you could do this? Um, and a TypeScript version and uh, what, wasn't there a competitor to TypeScript for a while that was popular and now isn't popular anymore? Like, I don't think it's your responsibility to do that for every single library that you maintain. It's just kind of difficult. So I'm going to say, uh, you're right, I saw that those definitions were out of date. Grimy face. On the other hand, uh, I don't think it's necessarily the responsibility of JavaScript module authors to maintain every every possible way of consuming their library, e.g. TypeScript, CoffeeScript, um, ES6 modules, etc. So. So for that reason, and I like ES6 modules, by the way, but I still don't think it's your responsibility to maintain like 20 different ways of consuming your, your 
um, your module. So for that reason, I, I really like definitely types approach of keeping the definitions in a separate repo. Uh, hopefully someone with more interest investment in TypeScript will go in and update the definitions. I mean, that's really like the most I can say, right? Like, that person is definitely not me because I don't know the first thing about TypeScript, you know? I wouldn't even know how to go in and fix it. So I, ho I hope I'm not coming across like a jerk. I'm not trying to. Um, a Dart, yeah, there's a good example. Are people still using Dart? So, uh, somebody, some poor soul at Google, I'm sure, is still using Dart. Um, the low-hanging fruits are the first to rot. Mm. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. That is kind of sad, though. That, um, you know, Robin, that could be a statement about a lot of open source projects. I've definitely seen some of the issues where you look at it and you're like, wow, that's like really easy. Like someone should be able to solve that. And instead, it just dies under a barrage of plus ones, you know? And like, you know, it ends up getting like seven plus ones and then no one ever fixes it. And it's really sad. It's sad to see that happen. But, um, it's the, it, it's the reality, you know, it's, it's impossible to keep on top of everything. But anyway, so I was going to go through the last of the PouchDB issues and then look into this fruit down issue and then finally in the end look at local NPM, which is something close to my heart because um, I actually use local NPM. And I know it has quite a few issues. And um, I have either run into some of those issues myself while using it um, it's not bulletproof. I'm sorry about that. It's a, you know, I, I did the best I could with that project. I have I have some pretty extensive tests in there, but you know, sometimes when you when it's a when it's something like a proxy layer over npm, you know, a tool that many developers are using every single day, like I think you're always going to run into like little little edge cases that are really really hard to track down, and so it's full of those edge cases, and so I would like to go in and fix it, um, but I'm kind of prioritizing the PouchDB stuff first. So let's see if I have some comments on, on Twitter. Um, anyway, so all right, let's let's see if we can make some progress on these remaining 17 issues, and then hopefully I will be able to reward myself with a beer and dinner and then sleep. Okay, so somebody reported an issue on PouchDB, a sync error. Now I've seen this guy commenting a lot. And he posts a really long, uh, really long log. This is, I really wish people would post gist when they do this. Like, this is not cool. <laughs> like, am I, am I supposed to make any sense of this? Like, that, that's really hard for me to, to parse, you know? It's not even wrapped in, like, the back ticks or the things where you can, like, um, where you can, like, see it formatted. Um, so the stack trace, what, what are you running? Are you running to cases? Let me see, this 404 is normal, this 500, okay. This is almost undoubtedly a cores issue because I think it shows up in the log as 500, an unknown error, which we, we should really try to fix that and make it more obvious. The problem is that um, lots of people run into cores errors because they, they forget to configure cores on CouchDB and then they run into problems syncing and they're like, wow, what is cores? You know, because like nobody knows what cores is. People, I don't know. My experience is I didn't learn what cores was, cores was until I started on PouchDB. Like it's a really, so it's, it's kind of a weird, um, it's a weird thing in web development. Anyway, so long story short, I remember I tried to solve this problem a while ago by adding a helpful error message when you run into a cores issue, and then that ended up having to get uh, pulled back. Like we had to, uh, oh god, we had to roll back that commit because there were too many false. Uh, there were too many false positives. Like um, that error kept showing up. This error saying, "You have misconfigured cores. Please go configure cores." It kept showing up in issues, even where people hadn't run into cores issues, like when they ran into timeouts. And the reason it turned out is that you actually cannot detect cores errors in the browser, and it does not allow you to do so. It's like by it's per the spec. It's designed so that you cannot tell whether an error is uh, a timeout, uh, like an HTTP timeout. Um, a cores error or like any one of any any number of other things that could go wrong, you know, DNS or uh, 
or TLS handshake or you know all, all the all this stuff can go wrong and then what XML HTTP request gives you is status code zero. Like your design, it's designed to be opaque. You're not supposed to know. So unfortunately for me as a library author, that makes it really difficult for me to write good error messages where users understand what's going on. You know, So in this case, I, I'm pretty sure it was a core error, but it's hard for me to tell because the error we surface is just 500 unknown error, which usually happens because there was a status code zero. So, um, so I'm going to look through this. I'm going to glance at this, but I'm pretty sure that's what the issue is. And hopefully I can point this person in the right direction by telling them that's what the issue is. Someone else commented as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same, but after being away for two weeks, I returned to find replication spinning database encountered an unknown error for half the documents from the retrieve. Huh. Yeah, so I think all I can say is uh, unfortunately the 500 error is the least helpful error message we've ever, we, sh we can show to users. So yeah, it's impossible to say what the actual underlying issue is. Cores, timeouts, gremlins. <laughs> I'm not going to say gremlins. Um, that's kind of silly. Also, I, I find if you make like cultural references like that, sometimes people don't get it. So it's it, it's probably best to err on the side of caution and not make um, references like that. Um, in the case of the original poster, I'd say it's un, it's almost undoubtedly a cores error. So you may want to look into add cores to CouchDB which is a little script we wrote to fix exactly this. Um, I think at this point I can just say uh, I'll label it a bug and uh, needs steps to repairs. Oh, story of my life. Now, how's the video coming through? It's, it's, the sun's kind of setting right now, so I wonder how. It's okay. The light is still good. That's good. I put up a little curtain to make sure that the sun wasn't like, like glaring in my face like it was yesterday. It was kind of um, like... Yesterday, part of the video was kind of funny because it's like my curtain was like this high, and it's like I had like bright, bright mouth and then like dark eyes. So this is really fine for like half the video. But um, I don't want to. I don't want to give the impression that us open source maintainers are creepy people who live in the darkness with our shrouded, shrouded eyes. You know, I want us to look like normal people. Hopefully. So, um, yes, yeah, so the video seems to be coming through all right. Hmm. I would love to get contributions to local NPM. I think it's actually a pretty approachable project. I mean, it's it's basically Express. It's Express and Yargs to handle the command line stuff and uh, CouchDB. Um, the existing issues that are open right now, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to get to them later. But um, there, there's some subtle ones, but there's also some pretty easy low-hanging fruits in there. Um, what does Stanley say? I always edit the original post and link to a gist if the stack is too long. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. I never thought of doing that, but you're right. Um, sometimes I do go in and I edit people's posts in order to like format it if they forgot to format it, but I, never, I didn't think of adding a gist. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, 500 error, abort, retry, fail. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, seriously. Like, what else can you say? Like, it's... Oh, man, it's hard. Yeah. But... Um, Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So you, that's a good idea. Yeah. So by, so by posting it as an external gist, it still gets SEO'd by Google. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good habit. Um, well, I could do that in this case. Why not? Let's do that. Let's do that for fun. Yeah. It's a, it's a good idea. So I'm going to just go into gist. I'm just going to create a new gist. Uh, I'm going to name it. I'm going to name it. I'll just name it after the issue number. Can you believe CrashDB has 500? Issues. It's actually up to issue five hundred. It's an old. It's an old project. It's been around for a while. She's an old. She's an old dog. She's uh, she's, she's getting on in years. Anyway, let's uh, uh, stack trace. Okay, so let's go in and let's. Okay. Let's just copy all of this. I think that when you have a cores error, uh, Chrome does log it. But I. I, I could have sworn it logged it. I'd be. I'm kind of surprised it doesn't. Um, maybe it, maybe this this person just didn't manage to um, 
to copy it. Or maybe the error showed up in the network tab and not in the um, not in the console. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Stack trace dot text. Okay. Uh, and then um, I should probably mention that I'm editing this post, otherwise you might get a little freaked out. Um, let's just say. Uh, Exported to uh, external, just there. Okay, that should be fine. Yeah, let's see, that's a lot easier to read now, right? Okay, yeah, thanks, Danny. That's a good idea. Okay, so, all right, got through that issue. Throw error instead of just console log. Oh, I remember this one. This person actually even opened a pull request about this. Um, it has to do with IndexedDB transactions throwing errors in really odd cases. Probably in cases mostly where it's like you're like navigating away when a database transaction is happening, which can cause really subtle errors in different browsers, and it's actually really hard to reproduce. And the browsers are super inconsistent about this. But um, yeah, okay. Actually, I, I agree with Dale here. I remember this issue. Um, I remember that the first one. I think his solution was just to put an um, yeah to add an on abort. Um, I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna say plus one to what Dale said. I'm not gonna add mention him because I, I don't think he needs to be bugged. Uh, plus one to what Dale said, but I will say that I think so let me turn this down. But I think maybe how do I want to phrase this? But I think it would be better to add on aborts to yeah to separate usages of index db transactions rather than in one central place unless it can be done in a clean and consistent way yeah i mean on a board should never happen yeah it should never happen so i guess either we should add one global on a board listener or we should add it to every usage of index db transactions actually I, th I think the current code base is just kind of inconsistent about this because on a board, like in principle, should never happen. So from what I remember, on a board, so what I remember, the code base is just super inconsistent. Yeah, see, it does it in some places. Yeah, I I'll just point that out. Um, yeah. Right now, it looks like we incons inconsistently, inconsistently apply on a board. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I, I guess I, but I would, I would be okay with removing all those separate, uh, usages and just adding a global error handler in that one part of the code. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I might have actually closed that that person's pull request when they opened it for this exact thing, but um, really. So Robin says that when you edit a comment, the original poster can't edit it. Oh, he, he, yeah, he can't edit the gist, but he can still edit the comment, and then just like move it to a new gist, which I think is fine. Yeah. Anyway, I might have actually closed this person's pull request, but uh, I still I still feel like their pull request made sense, but only if we only only if we handled this on a board in one place and nowhere else, and like removed all the other usages is is how I feel. But also, it's, it's kind of a it's a it's a weird this is a, this is a weird issue because there's like there's nowhere in the PouchDB test suite that it even checks for on a board because on a board is not supposed to happen. Like I'm I'm trying to even remember per the spec, how it gets thrown. I think it gets thrown in weird cases where like, I don't know, like you're in one tab and you're on the same page in another tab and you close that tab while you're doing an operation, something like that. I don't really, I don't really remember exactly. And it's like, how are we gonna write a Mocha test around that? You know, it's, um, it's one of those unsolved issues, like how to, how to write multi-tab tests. I don't know if anyone solved that. Maybe someone has, but. In any case, I, I threw my two cents in. So uh, this was another issue that I opened where I just uh, had a recommendation for the docs that we add, like a nice diagram. 
Let's see what Nick says. Yeah. Yeah, Nick is always a champion for accessibility. So, um, yeah, kudos to him. So he's right. Um, I was saying that it'd be cool if we had like a um, a diagram showing how like sh like showing the whole PouchDB adapter ecosystem because it's really complicated and a lot of people like I, I think a lot of people get tripped up especially just on names because it's like like and a lot of it is my fault because I've written most of those adapters but like it's like you've got like say PouchDB using the Web SQL adapter which can run in Node over a thing called Node Web SQL which then depends on SQLite, and then like that Web SQL adapter can also use the SQLite plugin in Cordova, which is like a native plugin. It's like this thing is so confusing for people who you know might not even know what SQLite is, you know, when they start using this project. So my suggestion for this issue is that we have like a nice big diagram showing like, okay, here's the whole ecosystem, here's how it works in Node, here's how it works in the browser, here's how it might work in Cordova or in React Native. We don't have great React Native support right now, but someday, someday I'm I'm actually like I have a project where we're like this close. We're this close to having React Native support. Um, so it'd be great to have a diagram just showing like how all this stuff works. And Nick is absolutely right that um, instead of making a drawing, which was my suggestion, it should be accessible. It should be like a table or um, CSS or SVG or something. So um, yeah, plus one to that. He's right. That said, uh, I don't know if anyone's going to actually do it. So <laughs> who knows? You know, this is a help wanted issue. Anybody watching, if you want to take this up, um, I'd be happy to draw that diagram of how all this all this crap works. And if, if you wanted to if you wanted to convert that to an SVG, um, then um, I would not be averse to that. Yeah. Um, so this is an open issue, but um, I threw in my two cents. Actually, maybe I'll do that right now. This is kind of more. This that'd be a fun thing to do for a for a stream, right? If I just drew all that stuff, it'd be hard to draw with a mouse though. Um, oh, except you know I could use I could use this ASCII flow tool. I've used this before. It's kind of neat. I think it's called ASCII flow, where it's like you can draw. Yeah, like you can draw stuff and it becomes ASCII art. It's kind of neat. It's a great browser tool too. So actually, you know I can I'm actually going to go back to that other issue I was in, and I'll just post the ASCII art real quick so that people know like what I had in mind because it's kind of hard to visualize. So my idea was that like um, you would say like okay here's PouchDB oh no no I want oh, I'll put a label there what do you mean Control Z so my idea was like you have this uh, shoot what am I doing let's take this box let's resize it okay yeah we've resized it okay let's draw on it okay good. So my idea was that we would just explain, like, um, okay, here's PouchDB. Shit. Um, how do you move? Is this thing a move tool? No. What's the move tool? Oh, I guess it looks like it should be this. Oh, maybe this is like select and you can, oh, that's cool. This is an awesome tool, ASCII flow. This is really fun, actually. Okay. So my idea was that we would say, like, okay, here's PouchDB. And then it's like, um, mean two environments are going to be Node in the browser. And then there's also um, there's also Cordova, which is kind of its own thing. But let's just let's consider that, like, the browser. And then it has four adapters. So let's do, uh, let's just copy-paste this, actually. I do that. Copy-paste. No, it doesn't work. Too bad. Um, should be this should have a copy paste tool that would be excellent is there really no copy paste here it's too bad okay so let's just draw a box and uh so there's four adapters right like you've got uh, the main one the index db adapter which is what he uses in the browser and how do i resize this thing Right? That really doesn't look right. Shouldn't this be the box? Yeah. Okay. So you got the index DB adapter, and then uh, let's see. Then you got the Web SQL adapter, 
And then you've got the uh, HTTP adap adapter. You know, this is actually starting to even make more sense to me now when I think about PouchDB, actually, to draw this out. And these are adapters that allow it to talk to the file system. Ult ultimately, it talks to the file system. That's how this works. Like, these are um, abstraction layers that allow Couch to kind of implement like an abstract CouchDB database. Um, and then the, ultimately, somewhere, a file gets written. Like in this case, it writes to a SQLite database. In this case, it writes to an IndexedDB database. In this case, a LevelDB database. Somewhere, files are written. Um, and actually, while I'm thinking about it, Let's move this over to like, oops. Let's move this over to the node column. Let's call this node. This is kind of node land over here. And then let's make a new box. Let's call it um, HTTP. Because this is CouchDB's interface to CouchDB. And this works in both node and the browser. So if I, actually, let's just draw like, you know, let's draw like a line here. And let's call this, um, like on this side, it's node JS, and on this side, it's the browser. And the way that it works is that um, the HTTP adapter uh, can talk to talks to CouchDB or a CouchDB like like API. So, for instance, let's draw a box. Let's say, actually, let's scrub out. I don't like this. Let's scrub these out. Oops. Yeah, okay, let's scrub those out. And then, uh, yeah, this is fine. And then, actually, I don't even need these lines. These are kind of confusing. And then here, it talks to, like, CouchDB, CloudEnt. Like, there's, like, so many of these things, right? So many, too many of these things. Who made all these things? What were they thinking? Um, Couchbase, Sync, Gateway. There's a lot of these things. Um, I'll shorten this thing. Yeah, so that's basically how that works. And then, like, let's make this box a little bit bigger. That box does not look good. <laughs> this is not how that should look right now. It's um, looking sloppy. It's a sloppy, sloppy box. Okay, let's scrub this out, scrub this out, and then what's with this text? Can we fix this text? We can, cool. This is a really like intuitive interface, I like this. Okay, so yeah, so HTTP talks to this, and then, okay, let's actually move this out a little bit. I'm probably gonna have to make this bigger. And this one, I'm going to have to expand a little bit too. Yeah. OK. And then LevelDB actually has a bunch of, like, it has its own adapters, basically, um, which, like, I'm just going to write out real quick. And, like, actually, they, they even can run in the browser, not just Node. So uh, it's actually not even accurate for me to say Node.js anymore. But, like, there's a bunch of these, um, many of which I wrote. But these are all, like, they all end in down. It's just kind of like how they work. It's mem down. There's local storage down. There's fruit down. I think those are the only down adapters we currently support. There was another one we used to support, but we dropped support for it. It was level JS, which is Max Ogden's um, index DB adapter. So basically those, uh, are those all the ones we support? I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, it's like it's like basically, no, we actually support lots of downs. In LevelDB, or in Node.js, we actually support like basically anything that someone wrote and called it a down adapter, we support. With varying degrees of support because, I mean, they're all maintained by the community and they're not all, you know, battle tested. The first three are definitely battle tested because we actually test those in CI. The other down adapters, we don't really test them. We do not test in CI. Then there's IndexedDB, which is pretty straightforward, and then WebSQL, which is actually pretty complicated because that one... I have complicated it. Like this is actually my fault. I've been keeping this thing alive. Um, I, I am I am like the the diehard Web SQL fan on the PouchDB team. I don't, I don't think Dale has, has ever really enjoyed working with Web SQL, but I, I love Web SQL. I, I really get a kick out of it. Um, so I've been maintaining this thing anyway. So um, so it has it, it can talk to the SQLite plugin in Cordova. 
Um, let's just put it down here. Yeah, which is Cordova. Um, and then it can also talk to uh, Node Web SQL, which is which is obviously Node. Um, what else can it talk to? I think that's all actually. So I think this is basically it actually. This is like um, this is the whole spaghetti mess basically of PouchDB adapter ecosystem. Am I forgetting anything? You guys use PouchDB. I don't think there's anything I forgot here. I think these are all the adapters. Um, yeah, does it get does it get more complicated than this? I don't think so. I'm just gonna note that varying levels of support. Ooh, we got bugs, look at that. The V's are being converted to up symbols, that's really weird. Huh. That's really weird. Please make that a V. It's not gonna make that a V. Hmm. This thing has a bug. Uh can I think of a synonym for these things? Can I think of a synonym for this phrase that doesn't include the letter V? Um, I'm just going to put unsupported. I'm just going to say not officially supported. Because that's true. Okay. All right. Um, so I think that explains that. That explains that. Uh, oh, or I should just mention... Yeah, actually, this this pretty much explains the whole thing. Uh, it doesn't explain what the default is. Actually, that's I should probably explain that. Like, the default in all these cases, like the default for this one. The default in this case is is level down. Which um, can I edit all of this text? I guess I can. The default in this case is uh, just Web SQL. So that is pretty much the whole mess right there. That's kind of the way it works. Um, ooh, I can add a note here. Yeah, OK. OK, I think actually that's the whole thing. So basically, I'm just going to paste this um, into the issue I was just in, because this will hopefully make a little more sense out of what I was trying to say. Yeah, OK. Let's actually export this. How do you export? Export. Is that import or export? Export. Cool. Copy. Uh, okay. I agree. Accessibility is a big concern here. Uh, by the way, I went back and actually drew some ASCII art to show what I had in mind. I wonder how this will turn out. Yeah, that doesn't look so bad. That actually looks pretty good. Cool. OK. Um, so yeah, now I've drawn this big piece of ASCII art. That was fun. Small detour on this on this stream. <laughs> I, I, I was doing some real work for a while, and then I just decided that, hey, I'm going to draw some ASCII art for fun. Hope you guys are enjoying this. Let's see if I have any comments. I have no idea how many people are watching, but um, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about how many issues we're gonna we're gonna resolve. Okay. Um, all right. So I should be making some progress. We're down to fourteen on red. Fourteen on red. Okay. Only three patch to be bugs left. Cool. Let's just click on all of them. Let's just go through. Okay. Filtered replication bug. Fourteen days ago. Oh, Jeff. I haven't talked to Jeff in a long time, but he um he wrote Delta Pouch. Um. So let's see. Hmm. Um, let's see. Hmm. Well, he does have steps to reproduce, so let's actually look at his code. I don't actually know much about filtered replication. I haven't used it very much. I wrote some of the logic for it, but um, it's um, not something that I'm Super, super into. I haven't really recommended it to most people. Um, let's see. I was gonna, actually, looking at his code, his code looks correct. So, looks like he's filtering by, let's see, a filter 
class filters, all map, and then that should be a design document, I think. Wait. No, wait, this doesn't look right. Hang on a sec. Oh, no, that is right. Yeah, that is the syntax. Okay. So you created a design document called class filters, and then you created a function called all map. Yeah, that looks correct. Okay, it's function uh, doc.group equals map. Yeah, this looks right to me. And the doc looks like this with the group map. Okay, so yeah, that looks right. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see a design doc and a class doc. Huh. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this definitely looks like a bug. If you could add a test case and ideally even fix it, that would be awesome. Um, again, see, this is this is another case where it's like, it's a super edge casey kind of thing. Filtered replication is not something that everybody uses, and also he says it only works with filters, not with views. So it's even it's even an edge case of an edge case. And so like, um, you know, if somebody wanted to fix it, they could go in and fix it. But um, I, I almost always tell people not to use filtered replication if possible. And so just because it kind of has like performance implications and um, usually it's easier just to break up your databases into multiple database, databases. So uh, in these cases, I usually just recommend that people add, um, like I think, I think I would just recommend that he add a, a test case to the test to fix it. I think there's a good place to do this because I believe there's like, there's already somewhere in the tests where we have a bunch of tests for like filter replication and stuff. I think it's in here. Test integration. Test. Uh, I think it's test.replication.js, I think. And there should be a bunch of tests in here for filter replication. There's even a test for exactly the kind of issue that he's describing. So yeah, so like, yeah, so you would just have to add a test like this that captures his bug. Which, this test actually looks really similar to his test, so I'm not sure why it's working in this case, but not in his case. But maybe he can see the, the difference and then add a test and, and reproduce it. Um, would be, oh, did I do a permalink? Oh, I'm going to do a permalink. So, uh, again, if you weren't watching my stream earlier, a good trick here is um, when you have a link in GitHub, press Y and then watch the URL bar. So I press Y. And it goes from master, and then it actually like makes it a permalink, which is good because, like, what if the source code changes, and then like the line numbers don't match up anymore? So, I'm just gonna say a good place to start would be this test case, uh, which actually looks very similar to the code you posted. So I'm not sure why it's succeeding in one case but failing in the other. Yeah. And let's see, label it as, it, it clearly seems like a bug. I don't think it's his bug, I think it is our bug. Um, I'm gonna say help wanted and needs reproducing, because it does. Okay. All right, uh, okay. What is this issue? The UA, oh yeah, I opened this issue. Um, I don't think we should be user agent sniffing if we can avoid it, it's a bad practice. Um, Okay, well, yeah. I mean, he's right. That's a good point. But is the solution to just uh, have a site that's broken in IE and Safari but works in Chrome Firefox? I suppose in some cases that's okay. Electron, etc. But uh, personally, I. But, um, I tend to prefer fixing all browsers if possible. Because so what this issue is is that um, IE and Safari are really aggressive in caching, like caching GET requests in the case of IE and POST requests in the case of Safari. And so to break that caching, we append a nonce, like we append like a, a random query string parameter to every request. And some people got really annoyed by that, especially because it like kind of clutters up the dev tools and makes it hard to see like what requests you were making to CouchDB. Also, it, it does break in this one case, he's right. There's like, um, CouchDB supports rewrite rules, and if you append this nonce, it doesn't 
doesn't work, I think. Uh, something like that. But this is kind of an edge case, and, like, my feeling is that, uh, yeah, we should either always append a nonce or never append a nonce, honestly. Like, and my, my, my gut is that we should, my gut feeling is we should just always append it, because, like, then it'll work the same in all browsers, and at least people won't run into a situation where, like, something works in Chrome and Firefox, and then they find out days later from their users that it's broken in IE, you know? Like, we want to avoid those issues. Like, the whole point of writing a JavaScript library, especially a browser library, is that they can test in just a few browsers and have it work everywhere. Like, that's ideally how it should work. One unified API that that smooths out all the browser differences. That's what we aim for, anyway, so. Um, let's see. Uh, what is this person talking about? One too many live replications not working. Huh. Hmm, that's an interesting issue. Um, hmm. Hmm. That's a really interesting error. Um, hmm. One local database synced with one or more remote databases. I'll work well with one remote, but from two remotes, the live replication is not working. It's funny, because I don't see in his code where he's doing uh, multiple replications. I only see one. Um, and he enabled cores, OK. Huh. Um, is it possible you're running into the six to eight um, network request limit that most browsers have? If you see many hanging requests in the DevTools network tab, then that could be the issue. Yeah, because you can't have more than, like, it depends on the browser, but you can't have more than six or eight network connections going at one time. The browser just disallows it. So that might be what he's running into. It's kind of hard to say. I would say this is another thing that needs, it needs reproducing. Like, based on the code that he posted, it's not really enough to figure out what's happening. All right. Whew. I'm all out of PouchDB issues. Um, I only have 11 left. Um, see how many people are still on the stream? We got five people watching. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I gotta admit, I'm I'm getting pretty tired about now, and I really did want to get to inbox zero, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to. Um, I might I might look into these remaining issues later. I, I did want to look into this this Fujian issue on Safari, local npm. I feel like I want like a solid block of time to work on local npm. Um, at the very least, I could go in there and respond to those people, but I'm starting to get pretty tired. I'm probably just gonna go get something to eat about this time. Um, yeah, oh, that's interesting. He actually filed a bug on WebKit about this. I wonder if he provided steps to reproduce. I'm not authorized to access this bug. Huh. I have never seen this in the WebKit bugzilla before. I didn't realize that some bugs could be private. I thought, I thought it was all public. Huh. That's interesting. I wonder if I've ever linked to a, bugs, a Bugzilla bug from WebKit and someone else wasn't able to see it. I thought they were able to see it. Huh. That's really weird. Um, hmm, that is really weird. I think I already put this bug on my to-do list, like this stuff I'm working on. It should be in here somewhere. Yeah, um, this is issue number three, right? Yeah, I already added it to my list. So this is this is the kind of thing I want to get to eventually, but I have to get to inbox zero first. So um, yeah, you know what, stream? Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've had a lot of fun uh, talking with you guys and doing some open source work and kind of like showing what it's like to do this stuff and what uh, a typical <laughs> Saturday or Sunday is like for me, at least when I'm like, when I've decided like I'm gonna devote myself to open source this weekend. Um, I hope it's been interesting and enlightening, and um, I, I hope that uh, that you had a lot of fun, and that it wasn't dull, and that uh, you know, that, that you got something out of it. That like um, it was more than just watching some dude 
use a computer and close bugs for a couple hours. But anyway, we are three and a half hours in, and I'm, I'm at inbox 10 rather than inbox 0, which is 10 more than I want it to be at this point, but it's at least, uh, it's way better than where I started, which was yesterday morning I started at 150-something unread notifications, and I'm at 10. So um, I'm definitely in a better place than I was before. But I'm going to sign off stream. I had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I'm definitely going to do this again. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I hope you all enjoyed it too. And you know, maybe I'll be able to figure out um, a good way to coordinate like the chat and the and the editor and uh, GitHub. Maybe I'll maybe I'll use a. Um... Oh, cool. Oh, Zach. Hey, nice to see you. Yeah. Um, I hope the delay wasn't too annoying either. I know that there's like a 20 second delay or something here, so it's like communicating, <laughs> like. I'm speaking to you from the future, and you're speaking to me from the past, or vice versa, I guess. No, that's right. Um, anyway, I, I hope it was interesting. I hope it was fun. Um, this is my workflow. This is what I do. Um, you know, and uh, please do, if, if any of you want to take up any of these issues that I looked at, and I was like, I just don't have time for it, like, um, you know, feel free to look into it, because a lot of this stuff, I think, is doable. I mean, there was one issue we looked at where it was like, wow, that person did everything but write the pull request, right? So perfect case where someone could go in and, and add the pull request from that code. Um, so I encourage anybody watching this uh, to, to, to get inspired and to go do open source. And you know what? Like, start your own project as well, because um, it's not just cool to contribute to other people's projects. It's also cool to start your own. And then you can create a community around it. And it can be really, it can be really satisfying to get these, these issues. Like, I, I do this because I get a kick out of it. I get a kick out of seeing how people are using my software. I have a lot of fun, like, learning all the strange ways that people might use code I wrote. And the, the strangest one I can think of was when we had an issue on PouchDB where someone mentioned that um, they, I think they worked for, they were like a contractor in Chile working for the Chilean government, and they said that PouchDB was now on, was, was now deployed on every commercial Chilean fishing boat. And like, I have no idea why you would want to use PouchDB for that. For that. that is definitely not what I think of when I'm working on PouchDB. That's not what I set what I set out. That was not my mission in life. It's not to make PouchDB the best Chilean fishing boat sync software. But apparently someone thought that they should use it that way. And that's really cool. I've seen lots of, 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 of interesting usages of my software. And um, yeah. And when you file bugs and when you file uh, when you ask questions and when you open pull requests, you are doing a service to the community, you know? Like even if it does like add on to the uh, the time that maintainers have to spend going in and like triaging issues and responding to them and stuff, like it's it's very valuable for the community. Many of these issues I didn't really have to look at because it was kind of like someone asked a question, someone else answered it, and or or like posted that they ran into the same issue and provided more details. Then the other person said, "Oh, I worked around it this way," and the other person said, "Oh, I resolved it that way," and then. Through this, they were able to help themselves, and the maintainer didn't even really have to do anything. That that does happen, you know, it happens frequently. Um, but yeah, so when you do that, you are you are definitely contributing to open source. Even just opening an issue, you are contributing to open source. And um, I, I hope that this this presentation, like or this uh, this live stream, makes it feel a little less alien. Like sometimes it can feel kind of kind of cold and distant when you're doing open source because it's like. I mean, sometimes you don't even see people's faces, right? Like, I, I try to make a point of putting my, my face in profiles. Not everyone feels comfortable doing that. I can totally understand why, um, why you wouldn't want to do that. But um, in any case, even with the profile pictures, often it feels very impersonal, you know? So hopefully this, I don't, I don't know, kind of humanizes open source a little bit. Um, and I can't say I speak for every single open source maintainer, but this is definitely, like, the kind of the lifestyle that I have working at open source. Some people do it for their jobs. I do it almost 99.9% .9 for my own enjoyment and in my spare time. And, um, and I, I really do love it. It's, um, it's something I look forward to. I definitely have a lot of fun with this. I, I will admit I often have more fun writing new projects and new features rather than responding to issues and bug fixes. But bug fixes can be interesting too. Like the one at the top of the show was really, really fun to do actually. Um, that was a very satisfying issue because uh, like the bug was pretty easy to solve and we got in there and I think we actually solved some other bugs while we were at it. You know, we just like, we cleaned up the code as we were in there, right? It's like, um, it's like the Boy Scout motto or slogan or something. It's like, you know, like you, you leave the campsite better than you found it, right? And I think we managed to do that in that code base. So um, that was very satisfying. 
Anyway, uh, I'm done soliloquizing. I hope you all had fun and that you enjoyed watching this. I'm going to sign off. I'm going to give myself a well-deserved uh, pint of beer and uh, some dinner. And um, I, hope, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you all uh, contribute to open source and maybe start your own open source live stream. Maybe we can make this a thing. Huh. Um, so thanks, signing off. I had fun. Hope you guys did too. Bye.